We'll get started then with a roll call. Again, a good morning. We convened earlier for an agenda setting meeting. Nice to see everyone again at 10. Here we are, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, I'm here. Excellent, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here, good morning. And Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning, I'm here. Great, thank you. We'll get started and, and um, again, as we've already noted, some. We are convening today using our um, virtual uh, connectivity uh, platform that's allowed us to meet this way since the governor issued a declaration of emergency well over a year ago uh, due to the pandemic. We've been able to uh, really use this um, virtual platform successfully during this period. Um, <clears throat> We are convening today on May 26, just after 10 a.m. It is public meeting number 345. It's a somewhat of a special meeting. We don't have, uh, we don't have a, uh, excuse me, minutes to address at this time. I did want to just start with uh, just a, a short remarks that it's been 15 months, as I noted, since the Gaming Commission convened with all three casino licensees in a virtual setting much like today's, to discuss the rapid reach of the coronavirus pandemic and the need to protect patrons and employees. On March 14, 2020, a Saturday, Flame Ridge Park Casino, MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor agreed with the commission's recommendation, the unimaginable really for the casino industry to temporarily suspend all operations. With that suspension came additional meetings, including two days of public roundtable discussions to develop guidelines that we all felt would support a sustainable reopening in July of last year. The three licensees we all have acknowledged have cooperated fully throughout this process, working always to serve the public's interest and protect their patrons and employees. The Gaming Commission, our IEB, reported regularly on that compliance, and we thank Playmage Park Casino, MGM Springfield, and Encore Boston Harbor today for its compliance and dedication to health and safety <clears throat> during this difficult period. We have consistently said that our regulatory oversight would follow the public health trends. Today, we reconvene as the CDC's guidance and that of the Baker Political Toledo administration shifts to reflect the encouraging data on the risks associated with COVID-19 here in the Commonwealth. So I just want to set the stage for today's meeting and a, a similar roundtable discussion. As the governor lifts all COVID-19 related restrictions effective May 29th, individual industries and employers are encouraged to formulate their own plans for transitioning into a full open operating environment. Today we will hear first from representatives from the casino, racing, and simulcasting industries as to their desires and expectations given the governor's new order. Second, the Gaming Commission adopted and imposed industry standards that in turn we must discuss and address today. After each individual presentation, I will invite open discussion among the commissioners and the licensees, and I encourage commissioners to ask every question that you have and, and invite that open discussion that we enjoyed back uh, in June of 2020 when we thought about a sustained reopening. And then finally, the IEB and Horse Racing Division will be asked to update the commission on how it will implement and operationalize the changes that we expect to adopt today um, and if need be we can get an updated report from IEB at a later meeting. So before I turn the meeting over though to IEB Director Lilios, I feel confident I can say this um, on behalf of my fellow commissioners that I wish to extend my sincere gratitude to the entire MGC team for its consistent commitment over the last 15 months. <clears throat> We have recognized your efforts along the way. In fact, the entire team was awarded the MGC's McHugh Award at the end of 2020 in light of its uh, 
commitment and dedication well beyond its regular operating obligations. But the 29th of May will mark an important milestone that we accept with hope and excitement and with a prayer and our fingers crossed. So to Executive Director Wells, IEB Director Lilios, Captain Connors of our GEU, thank you for your leadership and thank you to your teams. Well, you really have been extraordinary and we can't express our gratitude really in, in any uh, fulsome way, perhaps because we are working virtually. But if, if we were there, personally, I think there would be hugs. So with that, we'll get started and I'm going to call um, the meeting fully to order with beginning with uh, Director Lilios. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners, and uh, thank you for setting the stage so nicely for this discussion uh, this morning. I wanted to bring your attention to three documents that are in your packet. Uh, the three documents reflect the universe of COVID-related measures that have been adopted by the Commission that remain in place today. Uh, the first one, which is dated June 23rd of 2020, uh, is a seven-page document uh, that was adopted by the Commission with very comprehensive standards preparing for the reopening after the temporary closure. The second document, which is dated October 8th of 2020, reflects the Commission's determination to allow the two category one properties to reintroduce the game of roulette uh, with uh, significant restrictions on player numbers, plexiglass and, and other restrictions. And then the final document dated March 11th, 2021, a year and one day after the declaration of the state of emergency reflects the commission's measures that were adopted to allow an additional fourth seat at blackjack tables uh, and uh, to allow the category one uh, casinos to reintroduce the game of craps again with uh, significant uh, restrictions. As you know from the routine reporting that's been done, or I don't know, routine is nothing's routine, been routine about this, but the regular reporting that's been done to you, uh, there has been uh, broad compliance uh, and such a high degree of cooperation from the licensees and from the from the public. Uh, so, Chair, in light of the uh, where we are uh, today, uh, as you described so well. Um, the IEB has been in touch with the licensees over the course of the past approximately one uh, week about their possible plans moving forward because, of course, uh, any movement forward, we maintain our responsibility uh, to uh, do anything in a safe and orderly fashion, uh, and maintain public safety, and maintain uh, integrity in gaming. Uh, so at this point, I think it's appropriate uh, to turn the conversation uh, over to the licensees. Uh, I'd ask uh, Encore uh, to have a conversation with you about uh, its thoughts about moving forward uh, to this next stage. Um, and I'd invite, I know that uh, uh, Jackie Crum is available to do so, so I would invite her to, uh, to jump right in and and address you uh, with their uh, intended plans for moving forward. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning. Today is a, uh, a good day. So uh, a lot of excitement here at Encore. Um, I, I wanna echo your opening remarks, Madam Chair, if I can, because we've come a long way. It's been really, really difficult for our employees, for our guests. And I wanna thank the commission and the commission staff and the GEU for helping us develop and enforce these restrictions. Uh, I know it hasn't been easy for ever, anyone, and we very much appreciate the support and uh, the guidance. So jumping right in, if I could, uh, we would respectfully request that we can return to pre-pandemic operation based on business demand uh, in all areas of the facility. So this would mean uh, 
opening up every slot machine, every gaming table, uh, restoring our restaurants to, uh, to previous occupancy, restoring the uh, occupancy of the gaming floor, subject to uh, continue to follow the guidance and protocols issued by the CDC, the Department of Public Health, Everett's local Department of Public Health, and uh, continued state guidance. Uh, specifically, as it, as it pertains to face coverings, we would uh, continue to adhere to CDC guidance and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's advisory regarding face coverings and cloth masks. Uh, we would uh, allow fully vaccinated guests to not wear a mask, and we will continue to make complimentary masks available for guest use. Um, upon entering the gaming area, if guests are masked, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated, uh, we'll continue to ask them to briefly remove their mask to, to briefly lower their mask uh, for security purposes. On, with respect to our employees, as you are aware, we've launched a back of house campaign uh, encouraging our employees to get vaccinated. Uh, to further encourage vaccination, fully vaccinated employees who produce evidence of vaccination uh, are, receive a gift card from us. Uh, in addition, we've partnered with Cambridge Health Alliance to host a vaccination site at Uncle Boston Harbor with the hope that this makes it convenient uh, for our team members and their families to be vaccinated. Uh, while we strongly encourage vaccinations, uh, we, we do believe that it should be strictly voluntary. We will require employees who do not produce evidence of full vaccination to continue wearing a mask and uh, fully vaccinated employees uh, will not be required to wear a mask, but may choose to do so. On health and sanitation, and, and do you want me to stop for questions or just go through the whole presentation first? You know, I could jump in with a, with a question if, if that's okay. Uh, when you talk about your employee program, um, how will you discern uh, and monitor uh, the masking amongst your employees? You know, I understand they may have to produce something uh, at one point, but how will you monitor that on a, on a shift basis? Uh, we have a very discreet change to badging that will allow us to distinguish. So we, we're trying not to, uh, to necessarily uh, it, it make people have a big V on their forehead, but it's a very, um, it's a very subtle change to the badging that'll be uh, noticed, that'll be, that managers can then enforce the policy. Thank you. Jack, Jackie, I, I have a couple of questions on that. Um, one about employees uh, as a follow-up and one for sure. patrons. Um, just devil's advocate for a little bit. You mentioned the discreteness of the badging. Um, couldn't couldn't somebody couldn't I argue that um, having some kind of button or or not a big B on your forehead, but some kind of um, you know indicator that you have been fully vaccinated as an employee? Couldn't that um, bring some comfort to the patrons in some ways? Uh, so I think the comfort that we'll provide to the patrons is that our employees who are not fully vaccinated will be required to wear a mask, and they will know that. That'll be our policy that we'll put out on our website. Okay. Um, and then uh, the same question that Loretta asked for employees about patrons, how would you um, identify um, patrons who are vaccinated and um, in order to make that, uh, that call? Sure. Given the volume of patrons that come into our facility, uh, it's just, there's no way to do it other than go on the honor system per the state guidance, per the CDC and state guidance. We, I think it would be impossible for us to require every patron coming in to uh, show us a vaccination card, have our uh, security verify the vaccination and, we, and, and make sure that two weeks have passed. We would post signage uh, visible at every single entrance that reiterates the CDC policy um, so that we are informing the public. We'd also put that information on our website as well. Okay. Should we have um, Jackie continue, commissioners, uh, through the whole report? I, I see Eileen, um, because I think they'll be overlapping um, among the three licensees. So perhaps it might be good to have, as I suggest at the beginning, the the um, discussion will follow after each of the individual uh, licensees make their 
their plans because I think we'll have some overlapping uh, points to discuss. Um, so Jackie, thank you. We don't want Jackie to take all the heat, in other words. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, on our health and sanitation uh, programs, we're gonna continue to promote hygiene for guests and employees. Um, all of our employees have now received mandatory training for disinfection and safety protocols, and we'll continue to implement these protocols uh, as necessary. So we're going to continue to uh, provide and maintain hand sanitizers and disinfectants, wipe dispensers throughout the entire resort and the gaming area. Uh, in terms of transportation, the, per the CDC and state guidance, uh, we will continue to require uh, face coverings for both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals on all of our employee and guest shuttles, our, um, our car services, and on our water, uh, on our boats. Uh, we'll, we'll post appropriate signage at all these shuttle stops, the dock, the rideshare areas, notifying passenger, passengers of the continued requirement of a face covering. And we're also going to make sure that our uh, bus drivers and boat operators have extra masks because we do anticipate that some people will show up uh, not knowing that and have masks. We'll continue to make masks available really throughout the entire resort. On uh, cleaning procedures, as I said, we're going to continue with our enhanced cleaning procedures, uh, including uh, an increased frequency of cleaning and disinfecting all public areas with an emphasis on uh, high contact services, both front of and back of house. Uh, if we have a presumptive case of COVID-19 uh, in a guest room, we will remove that guest room from service until the room can be thoroughly uh, cleaned and disinfected. Our uh, air filter replacement system uh, will remain as we have had throughout the, throughout the entire pandemic and will continue our uh, HVAC cleaning system at the enhanced level that we've been doing. In terms of signage, uh, we intend to post signage uh, advising guests of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Advisory regarding face, uh, face coverings and cloth masks. Uh, we will define uh, what full vaccination is, uh, that is second dose, sorry, two weeks after a second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, or uh, two weeks after the single uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, we will continue to advise guests, uh, including fully vaccinated individuals, if they're showing any symptoms, they should uh, be tested, wear a mask, and uh, not enter the facility. Uh, on guest communication, uh, all of our protocols and procedures will be on our, will continue to be, I should say, on our website. We'll also post a copy of the Massachusetts Department of uh, Public Health's advisory regarding face coverings and cloth, cloth masks. In terms of case notification, we will continue to notify the Everett Department of Public Health of any positive cases of COVID-19 that we are aware of, uh, and we can, we can continue to uh, notify the IEB as well. In addition, we'll continue our internal contact tracing protocols and employee uh, quarantine policy. Uh, including uh, paying employees who test positive for COVID uh, to encourage them to let us know and to continue to stay home. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, uh, we would like to return occupancy limits for all sections of the building and restore all gaming positions, both gaming tables and slot machines. Uh, we, will, uh, we would like to remove all plexiglass uh, subject to business demand uh, if we see that some guests prefer the flexi, uh, we would do that in a, uh, we, we would see based on that and, and keep flexi pot potentially in some locations. In other amenities, we would like to also resume full operation uh, subject to business demand in our hotel, retail, salon, spa, events and meeting areas. I'm pleased to say that we're, we're seeing great interest and in, uh, bookings have really picked up. Uh, food and beverage operations, uh, in particular, we would like beverage service to be fully restored on the casino floor and to allow guests to uh, circulate with food or beverage. Uh, at the current time, we intend to continue operating the hotel from Thursday through Sunday night, and uh, we'll look at our projects and adjust that to uh, meet demand. On security, uh, we will return security uh, to our pre-pandemic levels uh, based on the increased occupancy and we'll continue to work with the Gaming Enforcement Unit to utilize additional details during high volume periods, 
high, high occupancy periods. Uh, all of our tenants, we're going to require them to comply with the same procedures that, that we are doing as well. And uh, on nightclub operations, uh, Big Night Entertainment runs our nightclub, Memoir, and uh, they will continue to be responsible for the operation of Memoir. They have informed us that they would like to uh, reopen in two phases. One would be a soft, what they call a soft reopening, uh, scheduled for June 4th and 5th which would be a relaxed lounge atmosphere designed to appeal to uh, a, less, uh, a less vibrant crowd, perhaps. Uh, there'd be a DJ cocktails and dancing, but with minimal, ta minimal tables. They wouldn't do a major promotional advertising of that event. Uh, phase two would be their grand reopening, which they'd like scheduled for July 11th through 13th. And uh, this would be a star-studded talent, and uh, the nightclub would be operated in accordance with pre-pandemic standards. Uh, Big Night Entertainment has, uh, operates a lot of nightclubs throughout uh, Boston as well as in Connecticut. Uh, they, they feel very confident that they can do this uh, in, in a safe manner. They have uh, advised us that they will get professionally trained security staff at pre-pandemic levels, and they will also have uh, additional police details, also consistent with pre-pandemic levels. That, oh, you had asked a question about poker. Uh, we're continuing to assess whether to bring back live poker operations, and uh, we anticipate that we'll communicate a decision on or before December 31st. Uh, on that point, Jackie, could I ask you to address the, uh, the bad beat jackpot with the intention uh, with that? So uh, we will work uh, with uh, Bruce Bruce's group to make sure that we are uh, providing that to poker players that we're uh, advertising it that way and we can do an event to uh, return that to poker players specifically. Did you have um, uh, an idea of the effective time in mind that uh, you would like to, uh, you're suggesting doing this transition? Was it on the 29th? Uh, we, we would certainly be ready to go uh, at 12.01 a.m. on the 29th if permitted to do so. Uh, would you be able to work with the GameSense staff regarding any modifications to their space? Absolutely. We'd, we'd help them uh, transition in, in the manner that they choose to do so. And what are your thoughts about your uh, conference space? Um, what, what can you tell the uh, commission about that, the convention space? Sure. So. Um, we, we're already operating the uh, convention space in accordance with the guidance, with state guidance. Uh, obviously, uh, we'd increase occupancy limits in those spaces and uh, adhere to uh, any guidance that, we, that the state issues. I don't believe there's any further restriction on those areas at this time. And are you able to speak at all to any plans for any outdoor, uh, anything you're planning for outdoor space? We will be uh, programming the event lawn for the summer. Uh, we intend to have uh, beer gardens and uh, live, uh, live performances out uh, on that lawn. I didn't have anything else, Chair. Um, so uh, Loretta is, is making sure that um, each uh, licensee covers the certain categories that really are outlined in, uh, in our guidelines. Uh, so that's why she's drilling down on specifics because, of course, the guidelines cover um, provision by provision these categories. Jackie, do you have anything else you want to add at this time before we shift to MGM Springfield? Are you all set? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. And then we'll just hold our, our comments and questions and see where we have uh, intersections and commonalities. Loretta? Um, I think uh, Seth Stratton uh, from MGM Springfield, along with Daniel Miller, are prepared to address the uh, commission with their uh, thoughts. Good morning, Seth and Daniel. Good morning. Thank you for having us virtually. <clears throat> um, first, commissioners, let me start with stating that we at MGM Springfield are excited. We're, we're excited about the progress the Commonwealth has made uh, under the good stewardship of our state and city officials to, to deal with the COVID pandemic. It's a, I think many of us would echo that it's a source of pride um, in the Commonwealth of how well the state has done 
and dealing with this um, unprecedented situation. So we we want to thank our city and state officials for their strong leadership and getting us to this position. We are very excited for our employees to get back to work. Um, uh, many of them have been, and many of them are coming back now because of these restrictions lifting. So that's exciting for us. And we're really excited for our guests. Uh, we at Heart at MGM are fundamentally um, a, a hospitality and entertainment business. And we're excited to get back to doing what we do and entertaining folks and giving them an opportunity to visit our property. So it's really an exciting time for everyone. Um, we're, we're very thankful that, that we're here. And we also want to thank um, the Gaming Commission directly, and particularly um, the IEB under Loretta's uh, leadership for their very close collaboration um, through this period. It's been, um, there have been challenges for sure, but um, I think it's a model of regulator licensee collaboration through this period um, to, to get to where we've gotten and to do it responsibly. And there have been, it's been nothing but strong collaboration from from my standpoint. So, so thank you. Um, uh, I'll also thank Jackie for taking the lead. Um, we're going to just say me too, generally to, to what Jackie said. Um, we echo um, her comments. Um, we are very closely aligned both with uh, operationally um, what we plan to do, as well as the request to have um, all COVID related uh, restrictions lifted. Um, uh, but I will turn it over to Daniel uh, to walk through very high level some of the operational issues and, and really focus on anything that's um, different from what um, uh, Encore uh, raised because overall we are very closely aligned with uh, operationally uh, planning and, and the request. So Daniel, if you could um, uh, briefly walk through our, our plan and, and particularly focus on anything where there might be a, a difference uh, between our plans and, and uh, what Jackie outlined for us. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Lady Chair and Commissioners, again, for allowing us to speak to you. Um, so going through, as uh, Seth said, we are pretty much aligned with Encore and, and Jackie's team from a procedural perspective, um, even after May 29th. Um, probably the first difference I would throw out um, the, the back of house program that we're handling for our employees as an incentive uh, to become vaccinated um, is more a, a drawing. Um, employees have the opportunity if they get vaccinated, then upload their vaccination card to our HR system to be entered for cash prizes and also complimentary items here at MGM Springfield. Um, so we're, we're really trying to push uh, the idea of getting vaccinated. Um, but again, as Jackie said, it, it is still uh, voluntary on their part. We really want them to. Um, that would be the only real change there. Uh, we do and as far as guests coming in. Uh, Daniel, before you go, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just on okay. that employee piece, uh, because Jackie did, did talk about the ability for managers to be able to monitor that, monitor that on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have some uh, mechanism, um, you know, Jackie talked about the badging. Is there some mechanism that you have planned that will allow for that uh, yes. as well? Very similarly, um, you know, through us and our corporate partners, we will be applying a small decal um, to the, the company badge um, that will signify those who are vaccinated. Um, that will only be handed out either by HR representatives or myself in the role of the pandemic safety officer. Um, and we'll Thank have you. a list of those uh, who are indeed vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I was just also saying is similarly to them uh, regarding guests, um, it would be on the honor system. There wouldn't be a, a true manner for us to check every, every guest that walks through our doors uh, to see if they are or aren't vaccinated. Um, continuing down the next real area that there would be any kind of difference uh, relies on the transportation portion. Um, at this time, MGM Springfield is not looking to reinstate uh, our valet or limo services yet. Uh, we will, but but not you know in 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 the in the, in the course uh, of this coming week. Um, and so there won't be any additional signage to the point of vaccinated versus unvaccinated still wearing masks at this point. But if that is still required when we introduce those services, we will of course put that signage up and, and make sure people are following that. So. Um, Bear with me. Um, so 
beyond that, really and truthfully, it is more amenities uh, that we, we are looking to uh, engage as of May 29th uh, in, in line with, with Encore. Uh, we would look for um, all, all games and all gaming positions to be available to our, our own uh, guests. We would be looking to open, uh, at this time, just the walk-up bar and the casino bar. Um, we would not be looking to open the, the Commonwealth as a lounge again or the Knox bar area in, in the High Limit section. Um, they will come later. Uh, and then uh, one of the, the main other areas that we'd be looking at is over the summer, uh, we will uh, start to re-engage our uh, plaza area for our concert series. Um, and with it, along with that, just during the, the weekly concerts that would be once on Fridays between 7.30 and 9 p.m., uh, we would engage our plaza bar uh, as well. Um, but we would look for guests to be able to move around the floor freely uh, with, with food and drink again. Um, apart from that, not really, really any, any major differences between us and Encore. Thanks, Daniel. And if I could just add in a few um, affirmative components, which, I, which are uh, aligned, I, I believe, with Encore, but just to emphasize them is, again, we're looking for an ability to return, you know, at our discretion as, and as business demand dictates to, to pre-COVID, environment, but we will um, continue to largely, um, one, we will of course follow um, CDC guidance, um, but as a customer amenity and in, in addressing customer concerns, we will be keeping um, sanitizing wipes available. We will have masks available for those who are, um, are not vaccinated or more comfortable wearing one should they not have one with them. Um, we will um, look to be phasing out Plexi, but we will do that um, phased and we will likely keep some gaming amenities with Plexi in place um, based on our, our view that certain customers may feel more comfortable in that environment. So um, we, are, we are looking for flexibility to um, phase out COVID related restrictions um, uh, as we deem fit consistent with state and federal guidance, but we are not looking to eliminate uh, every um, COVID related uh, mitigation uh, strategy um, uh, as of the 29th. That'll be a gradual uh, process. Um, and um, we will, of course, keep the Gaming Commission apprised of um, how that's going. And Seth, is there a, a corporate, like enhanced cleaning protocol that is still in place and that you expect to uh, still uh, apply to the Springfield property. Dan, could you uh, feel that one? Yes, so we have our seven point health and safety plan uh, that was created uh, prior to reopening that will still be available uh, that we will you know, train using uh, for both employees and, and sanitization equipment. And could you specifically address your in intentions with respect to the communication plan website, any social media and so forth? Yes, we will be updating all of those to reflect uh, similarly again to as Jackie mentioned the the CDC and and Massachusetts Department of Health information um, on on wearing masks for uh, for vaccinated versus unvaccinated um, and then physical signage at entrances will be updated as well. And with respect to reporting of COVID positives to uh, any that you become aware of on property to the local board of health and uh, to the IEB uh, and uh, your internal contact tracing protocol, was that something that you intended to continue? Yes, as the pandemic safety officer, uh, should we continue to get uh, positive cases, Loretta, you will continue to hear from me directly. Um, and what was your intention with respect to beverages uh, and food on the casino floor? we would uh, intend to go back to pre-pandemic where people are allowed to move around freely with those. And in terms of your tenants, what's your expectation with any with tenants? That we would expect them to continue to follow the correct CDC and, and Department of Health guidelines uh, as, as put forward. Um, we wouldn't interrupt their, their daily operations directly, but we would ask them to continue in the same vein they had previously. And I, I ability to work with game sense on uh, regarding any modifications to their space is, is yes I've already begun a conversation with with the uh, supervisor Amy Gabrillo there uh, regarding what they would like to do and not like to do yes I, I think we covered all the significant points um, 
share that I'm tracking. Thank you, uh, Daniel and Seth. Do you have anything else you wish to add before shifting to PPC? Nothing else now. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And good morning, North. Nice to see you. Nice. I'll let uh, Director Lilios properly introduce you. Okay, so North Groundsel is representing Plainridge Park Casino this morning. Uh, he is the GM, as you know, uh, and he would like to speak with you about that property's uh, intentions moving forward. Thank you, Gretel. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as I prepared for uh, our time this morning, I was reminded uh, that I should be thankful um, that, and that we should express that thanks. Um, first to the MGC for their guidance and partnership over what has been a really long uh, and um, winding journey we've all been on together. So we, we very much appreciate your partnership and guidance. Uh, we appreciate our guests who've trusted us with their safety, who've been patient as we asked them to comply with a number of different health and safety measures, and for the business that they provide, uh, which supports the Commonwealth, our community, and so many of our team members. And lastly, we want to thank our team members primarily for coming to work during uncertain times, um, enforcing mandates that have been necessary, like mask wearing, temperature scans, uh, ice all those types of things, and for doing the noble work of hospitality professionals uh, who are often working when many others are at leisure. So for all of those things, we're thankful as we head into that discussion today. Um, and we do find ourselves coming towards the end of the, our COVID journey. Um, the governor, in consultation with the CDC and other relevant agencies and authorities, has made the determination that fully vaccinated individuals no longer need to socially distance or wear face coverings in most situations. Consistent with that guidance, PPC seeks approval to resume normal operations at the property on May 29th at 9 a.m. Although we describe this as normal operations, there'll be a few differences as compared to early 2020. And over the next few minutes, I want to highlight some of those major differences. Um, so firstly, both team members and guests are going to be asked to comply with the relevant advisories regarding face coverings, mainly that fully vaccinated individuals, as defined by the CDC, are not required to wear masks or face coverings. We do have incentives in place for both team members and guests. Uh, to get vaccinated, and we will not be asking team members or guests to provide proof of vaccination through a vaccine card. So uh, through the, the casino, um, again, guests will be required to comply with all relevant advisories regarding face coverings. Masks will remain available at all three entrances for guests who need one or are requesting one. Guests who are wearing masks or hats upon entry will be asked to required to lower their mask and or remove their hat for identity purposes. Temperature or health checks will remain available at all three entrances for guests who wish to be checked. COVID-19 cleaning and disinfection protocols will continue to occur throughout the property. Hand sanitizer will continue to be available in various areas of the gaming floor, racing areas, and casino, and casino entrances. We'll continue to maintain current air quality measures in place. Um, we will begin placing out of service machines back online in accordance with our slot move requirements as we can. And as with the other licensees, the removal of plexiglass will be a phased in um, item. We, uh, we, our designated pandemic safety officer will continue to notify the local board of health and MGC when we become aware of positive case on premises and to assist with data sharing and identification of individuals for and we will continue to maintain a log of all material communications with health, public health agencies related to COVID-19. With regards to alcohol sales, cocktail service would resume as normal. Um, standing guests would, would be served as guests and not be required to be seated. Food and beverage amenities uh, would return to normal operations, uh, which includes uh, the Revolution Bar, our outdoor racing apron, which has a um, food serve, outdoor food service area, our food court, and then also our fine dining restaurant slacks. Uh, racing operations will um, 
return to normal operations with the phased in removal of plexiglass um, and out of service self automated wagering machines will be placed back online. Um, with regards to how we plan to communicate to our guests, um, guests, we will be communicating with them um, using digital social media, website, and phone calls to notify our customers of what to expect when they visit the casinos. Our guests will be emailed a newsletter um, of the revised requirements. Our website will include communication to the public on hours of operation and helpful links and resources. Signage will be placed outside and inside the casino, um, ensuring guests are aware of the CDC, DPH, Plainville Board of Health guidelines. Um, and we will have signage that will include uh, directing guests not to enter if they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, informing guests of the mask guidelines, and indicating that masks covering the nose and mouth are required for, are not, are not required for unvaccinated individuals, uh, but are required for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals at all times when private transportation services, including ride shares, taxis, livery vehicles, shuttle buses, et cetera. Uh, with regards to team members, the communication part, uh, we'll begin some live pre-shift tra uh, trainings that commence on, on or before May 28th. We'll email our team members, we will text our team members, we will use our internal HR dashboard, we will send carrier pigeons if necessary, we'll make sure that they know everything that they need to know to serve guests uh, when we reopen the door. Uh, and then back of house department and signage. Um, so uh, I think that that pretty much wraps up. Um, the final piece will just be, of course, all of this is um, subject to us continuing to follow the public health guidance. Uh, we will continue to monitor and comply with all guidance and protocols issued by the CDC, the DPH, the local board of health and the host community and the Baker Polito administration for dealing with COVID-19. Guests and team members not following COVID-19 related health and safety protocols may be warned and or asked to leave if they refuse to comply. So as we close out our presentation, uh, we'll be guided as we have been since the beginning of the pandemic by three principles with us, which are that you know we want to be able to conduct uh, any activity that is permissible by law and regulation for which the business demand is present and that we have the team members available to meet those first two requirements. So with that, I'll pause and take any questions. Now, in North, I had a couple areas to ask you to uh, uh, to address. Um, the continued reporting of the COVID positives and your internal contact tracing, is that something you intend to continue? Yes, it is, Loretta, as, as well as us continuing to work with game sense management to determine if modifications to additional COVID-19 measures implemented need to be made. Thank you. With respect to communication with your tenants and expectations of, you know, those uh, vendors, uh, what's what's your intention there? So we will can communicate with the tenants. We have one tenant at this time, and and we remain in close coordination with them uh, through our food and beverage team. And also, the uh, uh, effective time would be twelve o one a.m. That's what you you would be looking at. So we are looking to go in place at 9 a.m. on the 29th. 9 a.m. on the 29th. I believe those are all of the areas that I had noted for Plain Ridge. I did miss one area with MGM that I need to go back, back to. You're ready. Okay, uh, poker, if you could address your intentions uh, about poker, including the Bad Beat Jackpot. Yes, Loretta. So we, we are in the same position as, as Jackie and Encore, where uh, we're continuing to monitor, uh, you know, needs for, for poker and whether we will bring that back. Uh, we'll, we'll, we too have decided to make a decision by or around December 31st. Uh, regarding the Bad, bad Beat Jackpot, uh, we do have it safely in an account that I've monthly reported on to the IEB, uh, keeping it there. And we have discussed some methods of, of hosting a way of returning that to the players um, in the event that poker was not to return. Um, but obviously we, we will uh, get with IAB to figure out what is the, the best and fairest option to return that to the players. 
Thank you. Could you just clarify the date that, that it sounded as though you just said you were going to be evaluating until a certain, certain date? Did yes. I mishear that? December 31st. December. Of this year, yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Anything so, Chair and, and Commissioners, those, those cover the areas that I was tracking. I, I hope uh, those presentations were helpful to you and uh, very helpful look to you as to how to proceed, how to proceed yeah. now. So this is, this is why I thought it was important to hear from all three licensees. You'll see, you see so much overlap. But now I want each commissioner to feel very comfortable asking questions. And maybe what we'll do is, is kind of have everyone do a round of questions so that um, as opposed to one commissioner asking all their questions, it might be uh, just allow for a little bit more inclusion that way. So I'll start with Commissioner Zunica. You're at my left today. Uh, so I, um, normally when we meet in person. Um, <laughs> That's right. It feels very, very relatable. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, uh, for those uh, thoughtful presentations. If I may, uh, I have um, a, a question that applies to, I believe, everybody. Um, um, and, uh, and it's relative to the partitions, to the plexiglass. And I understand the request. Uh, it seems reasonable to, to offer flexibility. And, and see how the business needs, um, how the customer's uh, pre preference, um, you know, plays out. But um, um, if you could, and I, and I know you're very good at, at, at determining those and ascertaining those customer preferences, uh, that, that's for business. but if you could, um, what would generally be your approach early on? Um, leave some open and see who congregates where, conduct some kind of informal or formal survey, um, do that prior or after uh, the opening? What, what can you say in terms of uh, removing those partitions? And uh, more specifically for table games, um, would you change the occupancy with partitions or leave them with the same number that we have per table? Um, I believe currently it's four on um, on blackjack tables um, and yeah four and whatever else there is for crafts for example would you want to change the configuration of those partitions leave them in place um, um, and again uh, how would you ascertain that business need especially in the early uh, days start with Jackie okay. <laughs> Um, I think what we, we have constant feedback from our customers. They're very, uh, they feel very comfortable telling us what they like and what they don't like. I think uh, one of the things we, we have received a ton of feedback on is in particular the configurations are much more difficult. They don't enjoy it as much with the current configuration of Plexi. So that's, that's definitely something we would probably take off all of those uh, on the dice games. On the other tables, we've thought through this. Uh, one idea was uh, whether we could remove the partitions between seats and leave up the between the dealer and the guests. That's something that uh, some of our customers have asked us about. Uh, and, and we've also had the advantage, frankly, of reopening in Las Vegas and seeing what the demand uh, is there. And what we've seen is that uh, most people are, have not expressed a preference for the plexi. And on the slots, I think it's a little bit easier if people choose to uh, social, choose to continue social distancing, and they can have that opportunity at the slots, uh, just the way they're currently configured. Uh, we do have options available for people to uh, sit more than six feet apart if that's if that's their preference. I'm happy to jump in for MGM. <clears throat> that's an important point, Jackie, because um, on the slots, one of the things that I'm sure Encore has done, and we've been forced to do. Um, to accommodate the social distancing has really reconfigured our slot floor so that many, as many slot machines are available as possible where they're socially distanced. And, and I think we received a understandable uh, request from the IEB to not engage in any more moves while we transition. And so I think the, the setup right now maximizes social distancing as it is. There are certain um, slots players, you know, Slots is, for some folks, a, a social interaction where they go with their spouse or their friends and want to sit next to each other. And if they're 
So we want to be able to accommodate those requests by um, or that <clears throat> the demand for that experience by having Plexi removed so folks can interact when they're playing. Um, I know that we are going to target our, our highest value machines, our high limits first, and then gradually move um, to the floor and see how what the customer feedback is um, from an MGM standpoint. And then um, with respect to tables, um, we, do, we do plan to remove um, Plexi from most of our tables, largely to um, accommodate additional gaming positions, of course, the vaccination and mask, um, mask for non-vaccinated folks will still be in place. We will, however, uh, I believe, plan to, for every game, have at least one table that is still equipped with Plexi um, to accommodate those customers who are more comfortable in that environment. But uh, we believe that as um, you know, progress is made, um, fewer and fewer people are going to be looking for that experience, but we want to have it available. Um, immediately for those who are more comfortable during this transition stage. Okay, any questions for PPC? Um, North, I don't know if you want to chime in. Obviously, you don't have the games, but in terms of plexiglass around the slots? Yeah, so I think I'm going to, it'll be kind of a little bit of a combination of what Jackie and Seth were saying. You know, first, I, I agree with Seth. Our, our floor is now set up in a way that, um, much more easily promotes social distancing. There are a lot more round bank configurations or configurations that allow for more distance in between games. Um, like uh, the players at Encore, our players are not shy about telling us about what it is uh, that they want to see on the casino floor. And of course, we always listen to that. And luckily, um, every day we have a vote at Plain Ridge. Our players vote with their wagers and tell us which games they want and which configurations are um, most desirable to them. And so that's something that we look at uh, to determine which, which direction sh we should be taking. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, you're normally to my right. Questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, starting all of this off, obviously, with the fact that the particularly the removing the mask and the plexi is really based on the honor system in terms of you know clientele coming in and being truthful about their status um if everyone's been pretty compliant going forward but even with the stats being where they are there there are going to have to be people coming in who are not fully vaccinated and so there's going to be a mix of people coming back in some of whom have to keep their mask on according to the advisories um i was happy to hear some of the commentary about from EBH and MGM, they're gonna keep at least one, um, I'm thinking maybe more than one would be appropriate coming out of the gates because the, the advisories are to, to continue with the social distancing if you're not fully vaccinated. So under the presumption that given our vaccination rates, you're going to have a mix early on coming in who are gonna to need to continue to function in that scenario because you're gonna bring back food and alcohol as well. Those people are gonna be removing their masks. Um, so I guess I'm sort of talking out loud some of the hesitations that I have in terms of taking everything down all at once. Um, and saying that I'm pleased to hear that there's going to be a, a ramping up of taking the flexi down. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the assessment of whether the plexi divider for the employees, the patrons, how that's gonna be managed. Um, and MGM also, if you could speak to that, I don't know, Seth, if you, uh, or Daniel talked about that in terms of whether you're going to give the employees the options um, of working at tables that continue to have a divider between them and the patrons. So uh, um, Daniel, feel free to chime in if you've had discussions with the team that I that I haven't, but I don't believe that's um, a discussion we've had thus far. We can certainly um, look at it, um, uh, and so Seth, what, what I'll throw out there is, although I, I haven't had a direct conversation about employees choosing uh, to work at a table that does or does not have Plexi added, um, what did come up in a comment with our VP of, of table operations was that, you know, with, with there being some tables with Plexi still on them, that will be an area that, you know, we're providing that extra protection for both sides, employee and guest. Um, you know, so 
Although it sounds to me like that will be an option. I'm not sure if it's a matter of we go pre-shift and say who would like to deal at the plant table or something like that. But uh, at, at least talks in that realm are, are, are happening. So. Okay. Um, and then just the other area that um, maybe this is something where, um, you know, Bruce Band can jump in or Laura can jump in, but um, rescinding the order potentially altogether and getting eliminating occupancy caps, the reality on the ground in terms of your process of rehiring and getting yourselves back up to the point where you could do full occupancy is going to take some period of time. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about how you would be able to message out to patrons. Uh, while in theory, maybe occupancy limits are gone, the reality on the ground is that's not gonna happen overnight. 12.01 a.m., it's not gonna mean everything is open and you know max occupancy can happen. So if you can talk a little bit uh, about how you're gonna message to people and, and maybe Bruce or Letter, if you wanna chime in in terms of how that's gonna work as you get back up to full capacity. Just to be clear, we're gonna have IED um, talk about the operational too after every, everything we discuss, but they can certainly chime in now too. Uh, go ahead, Jackie. For, uh, for the messaging that I'm curious to Right, I that. understand. But Jackie? Uh, so I'm happy to, I, I think we've got actually got a natural limit. I'm not worried about us getting a surge of people. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor that to make sure that it's safe, that we have sufficient personnel to, um, to make sure that uh, we don't want a situation where the casino is too crowded. That's something that we'd monitor no matter what. Uh, we also have a natural limit, which is our uh, parking. Uh, as soon as that fills up, we close the garage. And uh, that happens long before, frankly, uh, we get to an occupancy point where we're even getting 50% of the total occupancy. Yeah, and we have similarly for MGM, and once we hit the 40 and 50% um, capacities, that realistically was full capacity for us based on our amenities and slot machines. So we don't anticipate um, uh, materially more bodies uh, coming in because folks are aware that um, the casino is currently open. Uh, and so that's really customer demand driven. The messaging that we'll be uh, focused on is, you know, managing our customer expectations and customer experiences, what amenities will be Reopen, additional amenities will be re reopening what may not be so that we don't have people showing up thinking um, right. a certain amenity is available and it's not. And that will also naturally um, control, control volume and address the phasing. Um, right now, I think we, what we'll find is that um, we'll have similar uh, demand and turnout for gaming customers and they'll simply have more options and availability um, on the floor and it'll be easier to find a machine in a game position than, than it is presently with the additional um, uh, positions available. You know, at this point, I don't see them currently turning away numbers of people where they could, uh, you know, have more people come into the building. So I, I don't see it as being an immediate problem here. Uh, could be 4th of July or something, but uh, I think they would be in a, a comfortable place by, by then on a holiday weekend. As we continue our discussion, we might want to circle back to that issue um, when Captain Connors will be also available to answer questions as well as to the management of, of crowds. Uh, I'll jump to Commissioner Cameron now, and Commissioner O'Brien, we we're going to circle back to each of you for additional questions. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a follow-up question on vaccinations. I know um, Penn National, question for North in particular, um, you are not going to verify vaccinations with your staff. All three don't have a way of verifying with, um, with patrons, but I believe I heard, if I heard correctly, you're going to use the honor system with your staff as well. Are there any concerns that um, um, that other employees or patrons may have some um, may have concerns about that not being able to tell and not not knowing for sure the other two are using masks if they don't if they don't vaccinate and then uh, then a follow up with vaccinations for all three are most of the staff members so far uh, very uh, 
is it a higher percentage that choose to be vaccinated knowing that the, this is the work they do than say the, the general public? If you know that answer at this early date about you know, majority of staff members choosing to be vaccinated. So I can answer that. We started uh, collecting vaccination cards, uh, not this past Monday, but the Monday before. And we're at about 50% vaccinated right now. Um, fully vaccinated, I should mm -hmm. say. Uh, we know that there are a lot of people who are partially vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. And because I think it was April 19th where it opened to the general public. Oh, well, I may have the date a few days off, but those people wouldn't be fully vaccinated at this point. So we, we're tracking that information as well. So you, it sounds like you anticipate the great majority of your staff um, being vaccinated. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're certainly encouraging it. Nora, do you want to um, answer the specific question and then just... Yeah, so... Uh, I, yes, so making sure I'm off mute, Director Cameron, uh, Commissioner Cameron, um, you know, I, this one is one that's a little bit of a sticky wicket in that there are a lot of different things at play in asking for proof of vaccination. And so um, our corporate HR team is, has advised us um, that, you know, the, the system that we've proposed is, is the best one for us um, when, when looking at vaccination status. Now, speaking to just anecdotally what I know to be true uh, or what I very strongly believe to be true here at Plain Ridge Park, you know, the, the state is about 75% of adults receive, having received, I think at least one dose were within that realm. And I think that that population um, carries over pretty much here to Plain Ridge Park. We're fortunate enough to be just down the street from Gillette Stadium. Um, many of our team members have gone there or to their local health provider or to clinics at CVS or Sturdy Memorial, other locations in order uh, to be vaccinated. And the reason I know that is because they tell me, they tell me in the back hallway, hey, I just got my first shot or hey, I got my second shot, you know, and you know, or I'll tell them, hey, I, I got my second vaccine and, you know, I, it, was, it was the first day afterwards was a little rough, but I'm recovering. And so they've been very vocal and shared with us um, their experiences. And so I, I think that they're taking this serious. Um, I believe that they're following the guidance. I believe that they're, they're listening to the local health authorities, um, you know, on, on site. And, and the vast, vast majority of them are ones who are anxious to get the vaccine and, you know, are, are happy to share the status with us. Thank you. Yep. And, and Seth and Daniel to Commissioner's general question. Yeah, so I will just pick up here that, again, it, it is anecdotal, as, as um, North said, um, but it's, it's the conversation of choice amongst most people. Um, and it's the, the positive part of the conversation is people being proud that either they are fully vaccinated partially or going to get the vaccination. Um, I, I can't think, at least off the top of my head, of a conversation of someone being very against it or, or saying, I'm not going to get vaccinated. Um, so, and then we, I believe we only started the, the tracking process about a week or two ago uh, for uploading the vaccinations into our HR system. Uh, and of course that in of itself won't be a, a true indicator because there'll be people that haven't just uploaded their card yet. Um, so there'll be plenty of vaccinated out there that, that haven't gone in and done that. But uh, it, it sounds very positive on the ground, of course. Tom. Thank you. So I, I'll turn to a question that I have. Before I have Blair my question, I have to give props to um, North for managing to reference carrier pigeons in his opening remarks. So um, <laughs> whatever it takes. I love that. So um, this is for Seth and Daniel. You mentioned that the Commonwealth Bar will be, I think if I understood correctly, and, and, and forgive me, I might have missed a little bit of the commentary, um, might be singularly one of the amenities, a prominent amenity in, in your, your facility that won't open. I do know right now or I've been, I haven't seen that. I, I've been out to MGM, but only on the outdoors, um, that there are slot machines set up in that space at this time. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Jumping on this thing. Um, 
So the it won't open as a bar. It was um, formerly a lounge and was our uh, primary nightlife um, uh, venue on property. Um, we converted it to have slot machines uh, in there to maximize our slot machines. We will continue to have that space open for slot machines and we will have drink service to the customers for gaming like we do on the, the rest of the floor, but we don't presently intend to reopen the bar as a bar uh, and create a lounge environment there uh, at this time. Um, we, we did just finish not uh, several weeks ago putting the slot machines in there and it's been popular and we didn't anticipate you know the timeline being this this quick so we're going to give it some uh, some time um, we've had some really positive feedback by customers around that space um, it's nice and spread out and folks in, it's um, it is uh, raised a bit over the floor so it's been a popular uh, space so we're going to continue to use it that way and then reevaluate um, down the road whether we reactivate it as a more formal lounge environment. I'm going to just reflect upon on that because I understand I understand that you're suggesting it's still further apart. And to Commissioner O'Brien's point, while we're you know sort of ramping up the um, the lessening kind of little a funny a paradigm of the lessening of the restrictions. What I'm hearing you say is that that's more separate and apart, but I'm not hearing you say that come December 31st that you're anticipating restoring what I suspect might have been a key element to um, the initial proposal, but I, I don't know if that's true. Commissioners. Um, yeah, we will, and if I could clarify, because um, I do anticipate that we will reopen the bar there at some point. Um, what we've, what COVID's given us the opportunity to do with, with a few amenities, frankly, is um, while they've been closed, think about is it the best fit? Is there, should we pivot? And so I, I think we will see Commonwealth reactivated at some point with a bar environment. I think it'll be um, at this stage of conversations are let's focus on um, more of a lower key lounge environment versus a nightlife environment potentially in that space. Um, nightlife environment is popular for sure, but there are also resources, issues that go along um, with an environment like that. And so um, we're thinking that um, we might change the nature of what it looks like when we reopen it. And we're using this opportunity to evaluate that um, and figure out what the best fit for our property and our um, our customer demand is. But I do anticipate that the bar will be reactivated in Commonwealth, uh, just not right away. Okay. Um, Commissioner Zimiga, next question. Thank you. Um, yeah, this one is for for Jackie. Um, I don't believe you uh, you touched on the buffet um, in your remarks. Is there anything you can say about that in terms of programming and timing? Sure, the buffet is gone. It's been uh, pulled out. It's uh, currently a construction site. Uh, there is a smoke lounge area. Uh, it's going to have uh, LED uh, TVs, walls of LED. Uh, televisions and uh, additional food and beverage options available there too. And we anticipate that that will open uh, August, September of 21. So can, can people still take, get the tomahawk steaks and the uh, king crab that the buffet had? Uh, we will make sure that we have those offerings at other locations on, at the facility. All right, Th thank you. As soon as only imagining. <laughs> yeah, I, I only imagine what I would get at the buffet, that's all. <laughs> we studied but, the menu carefully, right? But but never did, because I am not allowed to. That's right. <laughs> One of the, um, the difficult difficulties of our job. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, is, is that it for right now? Will you reflect? Yeah, yeah, right now. Th th that's good, okay. thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, another question. This really focuses on the poker um, and the dealers in particular, who um, I understand have been not only the players, but the dealers have been um, quite curious about what the status is. And since it's been about 14, 15 months, 
um, if you guys could speak to what the plan is or what the status is for some of those dealers. I know, I believe Encore, you've talked about maybe MGM too, too about cross training and that some of them were offered other positions. Um, but if you guys could each speak a little bit more to that, because that's the other, the six months before you're going to make a judgment call and, and potentially not bringing it back just made me wonder what the status is going to be for some of those dealers. Sure. So we have continued to uh, operate a uh, dealer school throughout the pandemic to retrain uh, anyone who is interested in uh, learning another game. So uh, we have had a number of the poker dealers who've gone to Rex. Um, and we're in them as well. So, uh, you know, we, we're constantly reaching out to them to, uh, with new positions. We have, I think I mentioned this a couple of days ago, we have 45 different positions that we're hiring for right now and over 400 employees. So uh, we'll continue to reach out to them, but, uh, you know, at this, at this point, we've really got to see what our space, what the demand is and what our space uh, allows us to do. And Jackie, did you also, I'm sorry if I missed this, when you presented first, your date is also December? By December, we'll make it a, a, a definite. Okay, so I, I missed that. So both of you are saying something. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, uh, I don't know if I Seth said, or Daniel had anything yeah. on that. Yes. Uh, so again, similarly to, to Jackie, one, we're aligned just to confirm uh, for your chair regarding the date uh, that we, we set as a deadline. Um, you. So, you know, consistency among uh, the licensees was, was a good idea. Um, there, there has been talk of cross-training uh, for, for poker dealers in other roles. Um, there was a uh, previous uh, outreach uh, regarding uh, potential positions in the cage. Um, for, for when we, we have a, a, a need for cage cashiers. Um, I don't know at this particular moment uh, what the, the um, board plans are for the dealer's school, um, but uh, there, there is options to bring them in and potential cross-training uh, if they were to come back in, in other dealer roles. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Daniel, did you have anything? Yeah, I had the same exact question about poker. I was uh, interested in that. But um, just to follow up to um, MGM, Seth, um, uh, are you having a similar experience to Encore, meaning your hotel and spa are starting to show an uptick? And also, is there anything with the convention center? Um, or is it just that'll take a while to, to rebook a lot of those events? Yeah, sure. Happy to address that. Um, so. You know we're in, we're def, we're in a different market um, for sure than mm -hmm. than Encore, and so I think the demand is a little bit uh, different. We have had our and we have a smaller hotel. We have had our hotel active for um, we've had one and sometimes two floors open, and it's really invited casino guests. We've been monitoring in close uh, conversation with, uh, for instance, our local partner um, Paul Picnelli, who's a hotelier in, in the area and has several hotels has been gracious in sharing some of his uh, data on hotel demand in, it, in this area. It's been um, remarkably low until the past several weeks and we're seeing uh, now a pickup, um, and he shared with us a real pickup in uh, inquiries and demand. Um, so we're in the process of evaluating when um, reopening the hotel more fully um, will match that demand. Uh, and it's literally been in the past few weeks where we've seen that. And so we're starting to get inquiries again about uh, conventions and meetings in this second half of the year. And so we're in the planning process of um, uh, getting our team back in place and ready to sell those spaces. Um, we're in close collaboration with uh, the Mass Convention Center Authority and our, our MGM Springfield team that manages the Mass Mutual Center on behalf of the MCCA. Uh, in terms of the demand that they're seeing for events. Um, the phone is starting to ring, Sean Dolan reports, and um, we're starting to um, look to our entertainment team uh, to think about what entertainment programming looks like in the uh, Q3, Q4 of this year as the um, capacity restrictions will now allow. Um, so I think we're, we don't have any firm answers. We're in the kind of fact finding, uh, but it, it's very, very active right now in terms of uh, evaluating, planning, and figuring out when um, the time is right and what the demand is. And I think 
uh, a few weeks from now, we'll have a better answer and have some firmer deadlines and plans uh, on those amendments. Thank you. Okay, I, I do have a follow-up question, Seth. My apologies on the Commonwealth Bar. Um, you know, the benefit you know, of the opening is not only for the more patrons coming in, but also for more jobs. As I think about the Commonwealth um, Bar, um, <clears throat> There's a lot of complexities around the nightclub atmosphere that come right up as the light is just starting to shine in the tunnel. So I understand that perhaps it doesn't make sense that this reopen, but I also hear you saying you're evaluating your business, um, your business model and, and what the Commonwealth Bar and Lounge would look like. Do you know how many folks you usually in, in the past would have employed? Um, in that space, roughly, I, I'm not going to hold you, but sure. um, it's not a, it's not a large number. I don't know the exact number, Chair, but it's um, you know on a on a busy busy evening, you may have two bartenders and a few cocktail servers, so a total of um, five to six on on staff in a in a peak period, and then that kind of ebbs and flows a little bit based on peak off peak. But um, so it's you know on a on a shift, it's less than less than 10, um, but I, but to be, that space won't be immediately re reactivated, but we are, um, the higher volume bar from the standpoint of, um, I think customer number of drinks served activation is really um, the walk-up bar, which is behind, you know, is facing the casino floor behind Commonwealth, that'll be reopened. We added a bar, the uh, Island Casino Bar um, post-opening, um, which has been popular, that bar will reopen. And we're also looking at activating uh, our plaza bar for the um, plaza concert activations that we um, have announced um, outside. And so um, I know our food and beverage team is actively, uh, it's, it's actually probably beneficial that we're doing it phase because we need to get you know folks back and, and ready and they're working on that now. Uh, and so I think um, we'll, we'll definitely be bringing bartenders and uh, cocktail servers um, back um, uh, and having it phased actually helps because the one of the challenges um, as I'm sure you've heard from others is is you know is getting employees back um, it's not it's not as easy as um, we would like it to be <laughs> frankly um, well, that's gonna be my question I haven't heard from any of you today that you're imagining a I, it's been alluded to, but I wondered how how bad that challenge is for the 1201 or the 9 a.m. reopening for staffing purposes. Yeah, I mean, our, our I'll continue for MGM. Our, our key essential staff to, to ensure that we're complying with staffing minimums, I, I think we're in good shape, but it's, the, it's um, bringing back um, folks in the food and beverage uh, environment, entertainment environment, where you're having this confluence of events. We're looking to bring people back, but every bar and restaurant is now looking to up their staff. And so the competition um, for bringing those workers back um, is, is out there. There are folks who have decided, I think during COVID, that industry is particularly hard hit. There are folks who have I'm anecdotally decided to um, you know, either relocate, shift into different industries, uh, have been um, you know, and there there are have been incentives for employees um, who who are impacted, and so the market has fundamentally changed in this year, and so the labor market, and so we are there. Part of our phased reopening is driven not just on doing it responsibly, but on um, uh, on hiring and the ability to get folks back quickly. And we've really gone through. Um, I can't say that every every list. We've exhausted, but I, in speaking with um, our department leaders, they have, during our gradual reopening, we have gone through and, and offered and called back virtually every employee, and some are just have moved on or are choosing not to come back. And so now we're going back to the market for new employees. Um, and so I think um, there is a, there will be some natural staffing challenges. Uh, we think a phased 
ramp up will help with that. Just, uh, and then uh, Jackie, did you want to chime in on the challenge of the labor shortage? Sure, and I think that's uh, that's when we've been referring to business demand. It's also our ability to service that business demand. And I, uh, when I was talking earlier about sort of a natural limitation in terms of the number of guests, that's something that we're very cognizant of. We don't want people uh, coming here and not being able to uh, dine here or waiting two hours in line to to have a seat at a restaurant. So we're we're really trying to manage that and assess. But it's very difficult right now to see. To, to forecast how many guests are will suddenly come back on May 29th or May 30th. And so it's gonna take a little, little period of adjustment for us. You, you, you spoke a little bit, you alluded to the challenge a little bit, if my notes are right. Do you wanna elaborate? I, I think that we're seeing some of the same things that Jackie and Seth are seeing. Just, you know, it remains a challenging hiring environment. We have positions posted. We are making every effort uh, to make sure that former team members are aware of the, the opportunities that are available and that we're out actively recruiting. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what that brings. And then with that, of course, with new employees, for all three of you, there'll be additional training. And you did allude to training uh, North, so thank you. Thank you. Um, an ironic uh, outcome. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, do you have any other questions? Um, well, I was wondering about this, and I know it's a very low probability scenario, but um, um, because you deal with a lot of uh, people. Um, can you just speak a little bit about the, in the event that you encounter somebody who is, says he's not vaccinated but does not want to wear a mask, let's say, um, because, you know, they're that kind of person. How, how do you think that, might, that eventuality might have to be approached? When you know that the honor system is effectively not being adhered to. I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that, Commissioner Zuniga, because sure. I think we've, um, we're gonna handle it the same way we've been handling it this past year, because there are, have been, we've been very pleasantly surprised and encouraged by voluntary compliance with a mask, you know, for, for every patron, but not even the past 12 months, not every patron believes in mask wearing or believes it's appropriate, doesn't like the rule, doesn't uh, like to keep it on all the time. Again, those percentages are very low, but our that that's one of the um, skill sets that our security team and our managers have really developed over this time period is to be is to be stern about understanding and, and enforce our policies. Um, and so they're they're used to it. And I think it's just a different, slightly different twist that. You know, you say you have someone who acknowledges that they're not vaccinated, but still doesn't believe that they should uh, be wearing a mask. I, I view that as kind of a very similar to, you know, when all ma masks were mandatory for everyone and they didn't want to wear the mask and, and we enforce the policies and we do it, um, you know, respectfully, but sternly. And, um, and we haven't really seen any significant problems over the past 12 plus months. In that respect, so we're confident that it'll it'll be handled similarly um, moving forward. North, I agree with what Seth said. I mean, we're also blessed to have GEU on site. So if things uh, go too far sideways, we've got help there, and then uh, local police detail also. Jackie, are you all set? All set. I agree. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. Commissioner O'Brien. No, I had the same thought and the question that Commissioner Zuniga just asked, but aside from, you know, us deciding to implement a consequence to someone doing that, um, it's going to have to be up to the establishments and GEU. Um, and the governor, my understanding is, has shifted from an order to an advisory on the masks. So, that's something that I think if we see numbers that change going forward in the summer that we might want to think about as a commission, whether there's consequences to not complying with the establishment's rules. But um, 
again, it goes back, I think, to having to rely on the honor system, the people going in. Um, just a comment that I think, I don't think anyone is in disagreement with, but in that vein is why I think it's really important, uh, no matter how we move forward from today, that the licensees continue to report to IEB about the stats that they're having to see if we need to come back and readjust any of this if the honor system isn't working or numbers go up. Um, but it seems like everyone is cognizant of the, of the challenges of the honor system and how we go forward. So I, I've had most of my questions answered at this point. Just to confirm with respect to Commissioner O'Brien's comment, I think I heard, um, and you can confirm perhaps Loretta, that all three licensees anticipate keeping the pandemic um, officer in place and, and this time will confirm that they're going to continue to report um, any cases that they learn of, but also report on em their employees. We, we will. No, and, and that's, I'm sorry, Jackie. We do okay. intend to keep our pandemic officer in place. Uh, I think he really enjoys the position, so, uh, and we will continue to make those reports. And that's the case for MGM and. Yes. and Despite Daniel's uh, request, he will remain the pandemic. <laughs> pandemic safe officer. No, yes, he's, he fills the role aptly and is willing to do it and will continue. Thank you. And it's true for Plain Ridge as well. Excellent. Um, and so that will be in, uh, by consensus we're hearing uh, until perhaps there's changes. Um, as Commissioner O'Brien said, I, I think we would expect the, that to continue. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, do you have another question? I do not. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Uh, I think one uh, outstanding item, and I know I've mentioned it to Loretta, but I'll, I'll mention it now, is that uh, all three, I believe all three properties will continue to require those guests who want to wear a mask, even if they're fully vaccinated, or those who, for whatever reason, choose not to be fully vaccinated, will continue to adhere to the mask requirement. Um, of course, when we say choose, I'm really hoping our patrons um, are opting to join much of the Commonwealth, as as North pointed out. We're at such a high rate of vaccination, but perhaps they're, for whatever reason, are not fully vaccinated. They're going to wear their mask. Uh, that the properties will continue to require the mask to be lowered and identification to be knowledge. And I'm seeing the nodding heads on that. And I think with that, we'll have um, to adjust our internal control. Um, and I see Bruce nodding his head uh, because if, if we alter the guidelines, we would be out of compliance um, with that you know, pre-pandemic controls. That, that, yeah. That's Madam exactly Chair, we, right. We've oh, already asked all the casinos to adjust their uh, security submissions to address uh, that fact. Masking, right? Is that, Loretta, is that sufficient? It, it, it is, and as Bruce said, he has already circulated uh, some required language if we go in that direction so that uh, all three properties are poised uh, to submit that in a timely way so there's no, uh, no lapse in uh, coverage of the appropriate protocol. And then, uh, and Karen will just sign off on that so we don't need to address that uh, by the commission. Correct. Okay. Uh, I think all of my questions um, really have been answered through my fellow commissioners. Uh, but do we have anything else we just want to ask of the licensees? I guess one question I should ask before just a, I think yesterday was the opening of all burgers. How'd that go? Is that true? Yes, it is true. Um, and it went very well. There was a line that formed on Main Street at 6 a.m., um, which was surprising. A little bit surprising, but folks waited for hours outside for the doors to open at 11. Uh, Chef Paul Wahlberg was there to open the doors and invite everyone in. Uh, and it's my understanding that they were uh, very busy all day. Um, so um, they were pleased with the, the first day turnout. Um, so there's, there's definitely pent up demand and excitement. That's exciting. Uh, I suspect there'll be some changes in their signage now, just after they got it up. But, uh, that's all good news for them. Um, any other 
questions, comments, uh, I'll just go around one more uh, one time just to make sure you haven't thought of something else. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga? No, I, I have no questions. Uh, I, I, I think at this point, um, I think we're ready to, um, to get into deliberations or discussions. I'm happy to do that. So, uh, no questions. Okay, okay I'll, I'll circle back to you. Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set right now? I'm all set, thanks. Commissioner Kim? I am all set other than I am fascinated with the Wahlberger story. I, um, I, I, I thought maybe they had a new offering breakfast when they're there in line at 6 a.m., but that's not the case. They waited till 11, so that, wow, I guess that's going to be a big hit there. So thanks for telling us that. I think there, there may have been one or two fans in that line who were secretly hoping that they might catch a glimpse of, you know, Mark Wahlberg or... Um, so that could have driven some of it, um, which we're hopeful at some point, um, all the Wahlbergs are able to um, come visit the, the property. But um, yeah, it was, it was a big line and they had a great busy day. So it was fantastic. Excellent. Good for the city. Thank you. I would say meeting Chef Paul in, in, is a special treat. Um, so excellent. Um, so in terms of next steps, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, um, you mentioned deliberations. I think we've acknowledged that right now the guidelines that we adopted back in, I guess it was in June of 2020, um, now are still in place in order to allow um, the licensees to be able to um, proceed with what they're hoping for. It's really to lift all of our, our requirements. With that said, we, we could, um, of course, adopt uh, conditions or expectations, or we also have a record of today's meeting. So in terms of everything that they agreed to do, um, do you have, do you want to suggest a motion or do you want to uh, speak about how you'd like to proceed? Um, well, I was I was going to um, speak about what my general thoughts are on on the matter, and um, and we can get into any any details if if that happens organically. But I was going to start at the at the macro level, um, something that was touched on. Um, Massachusetts has one of the highest uh, uh, vaccination rates. It also has the lowest in the nation vaccine hesitancy. Um, uh, percentage, which converges, as was alluded to, uh, to the positive, uh, I believe, in the next couple of weeks as more people get second dosages or two weeks after the second dosage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which, which is why I believe, you know, frankly, the, um, the governor and the DPH uh, professionals uh, made the, the, the announcement that they made um, recently, even though that was expected much later. I would also, I would also note that, um, and I, I, I heard this in, in one of the, um, one of the news shows that I watch, a former CDC commissioner saying that um, the approach is potentially necessary um, in relaxing restrictions when things get better, uh, because it is at least possible that um, things could turn around, and um, for the worse, sadly. And it would be necessary to reimpose some of those uh, restrictions. And and for healthcare professionals and people in in, in positions like ours um, at the state level, of course, um, they need to be able to have that future ability to reimpose restrictions um, and and being overly strict when things have gotten better only lessens that probability by by losing some credibility. So in that. In that context, I'm generally um, satisfied with with relaxing restrictions um, at the casinos. I um, I think the plans are, um, um, are very appropriate. I think the, the continued um, uh, reporting um, uh, that, that we have in place um, uh, are are good approach in terms of how to continue monitoring this. Uh, and I think the last uh, 15 months of history, which was also alluded to, also offer a really good comfort level, in my opinion, relative to the ability to um, 
to continue offering an experience uh, for people that is in compliance with, with, uh, with the realities around us. So I'll stop there, uh, um, you know, at this point and, and, and see if anybody thinks differently, I suppose. Mr. Oh. Okay. Sorry, working on the iPad, it's not cooperating. Um, I would agree with what Commissioner Zuniga said. I think the last 15 months plus in terms of, you know, our staff, this commission and the licensees working together and communicating is what enabled everyone to keep the doors open. And so I think that following the guidance that we're getting from the CDC and from the governor and mindful of the fact that, as Commissioner Zuniga said, if this turns, we know we can also reconvene on a dime and do what needs to be done to you know, limit the exposure and the damage in the respective establishments. But I think I'm satisfied with the thought process that's gone into the reopening, the fact that there you know, is going to be ongoing communication as always with IEB, uh, the pandemic officer staying in place. Um, I think maybe the only clarification as I'm going through thinking about wording for a motion is um, it, historically we've had orders that obviously we all need to comply to. We've now shifted into the realm of advisories. Um, and so I think in addition to any orders that may be out there, everyone is on the same page that we're also complying with any advisories that have been put forward by the CDC and the governor in terms of the mask wearing and the social distancing, et cetera. This is the one I told you about last time I was here. Okay, so I'm gonna take two more. In place of that, remember that. Remember Lakeisha, that discussion. Okay, Lakeisha, you're you're you need to mute. Sorry, thank you. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I think that as long as that language is, we're considering lifting what was put into place uh, about a year ago. Um, I think that would cover. I think what needs to be done. I think everyone's on the same page, and they've done an excellent job, and are going to do a great job reopening. But then it gives us the ability to make sure that everyone is moving with any changing advisories that might fall short of an order. Commissioner Cameron then? Yeah, I would agree with everything said. Um, you know, I am very uh, comfortable with uh, what we heard here today, in particular with their uh, all three licensees constant monitoring of the needs of their staff, as well as the patrons, as well as the communication with the MGC. I just think it's been excellent and their plans moving forward are telling us that this is, you know, how they intend to operate. Um, so I'm, I have no concerns um, after listening to the presentations. It actually makes sense before and I'm, I'm rethinking my, my roadmap that I outlined. Um, for us to hear from IEB, um, to hear from Loretta, to hear from Bruce and Captain Connors, just so that they've heard this, if we were to, um, to proceed, given what you've heard uh, from the commissioners and lift our guidelines, um, do you see any operational challenges that we need to think about um, before we actually act on that formally? Um, I, I must say that like my fellow commissioners, I'm very comfortable with the, the plans that um, were outlined. They, they are what I expected um, and, and not because of just obvious business needs, but because of, the, of how you, the three licensees have operated over the course of the last 15 months. Um, you know, it's always been with the, the health and safety of the, the patrons, the public and the employees in mind. But you've also noted today, and of course all along, that you do it in partnership with um, the GEU and also with our gaming agents who are there and it, with the extra eyes of GameSense. So um, I think uh, it might make sense before we move, um, if we, you know, to hear, does that make sense, uh, commissioners, to hear from Loretta and Bruce and uh, Captain Connors at this juncture? Okay. then. Um, Loretta, why don't we start? And, and, and if you want to sort of chime in informally or sequentially, that's fine. However, sure. You want. Just to um, give you a general sense of the past 10 plus days uh, in the IEB, uh, we have been working to identify uh, 
operational, I wouldn't call them challenges, just operational matters that would need to be addressed uh, at any eventual loosening of restrictions. Uh, and we've been doing that with uh, Bruce and his whole team, uh, senior supervisors as well. And we've been doing that with <clears throat> Captain Connors uh, as well uh, in uh, many direct communications with the licensees amongst that group. Uh, last week, uh, we also were able to loop in our IT team uh, and our NOC because, of course, bringing uh, more slot machines online is not uh, just flipping a switch. Uh, we have to ensure the communication with uh, our CMS, uh, and uh, we're well into steps uh, to ensure that that would happen uh, on the 29th. Um, so I, I really think that the experts now are, are Bruce and Captain Connors, and you know I know they're prepared to uh, talk to you uh, this morning about what what they've been doing over the past ten days and how they uh, would view uh, loosening of uh, removing of restrictions with respect to the 29th. Uh, so uh, Captain Connors, if if you want to uh, go first, that'd be great. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, to Loretta's point, um, I mean, we've anticipated this major step towards reopening for quite some time now. So we've had a, a gradual build back up. Um, so from our standpoint, from the GEU standpoint, uh, we're in a very good position. I don't have any major concerns. Um, as the Commission knows, you know, the GEU is on site 24-7 at each of the locations. So we're able to report out in pretty significant uh, uh, quick time frame if there are any issues we can either address them with the licensees and their staff in real time or we can uh, also notify and converse with uh, Director Lilios and her staff uh, as well so and also if, if necessary we could come before the Commission and report out issues so so we have that ability to be sort of an eyes and ears out there as this um, reopening uh, to this extent rolls out and um, you know the adjustments have been made on our end. I don't anticipate any uh, significant uh, needs or from our end. So I think we're in a good position to return towards that pre-pandemic phase. And again, we will address issues as we see fit as they um, come up. We'll continue to work with the the licensee staff on any of these issues that we we've, we've talked about briefly today. You know the masking issues, and I think uh, I'm confident that between their staff and our staff, we'll handle them handle them uh, accordingly, uh, as we have all along. So, from our perspective, I think we're ready to go. We're we've been in good shape uh, for quite a while, and uh, I don't expect any any of that to change. Ma Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, I kind of feel the same way. I think our staff is ready. We'll be at full staffing uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, I, I've gotten nothing but cooperation from the licensees through this whole pandemic, and I don't see that stopping uh, going forward. Uh, I, I think as a group with GU and, and the casino licensees, if we uh, hit any problem at all, that we'll work it out quickly and, and to everybody's satisfaction. Uh, we're ready to report back to you as, you know, as to what we're seeing on, on site. Uh, I think we're all ready to move forward and actually get out of this pandemic and uh, get moving with regular business. So I think uh, from our standpoint, we're all ready to move forward and ready to do this. And just looping back, I have uh, you know confidence in our internal team and uh, you know confidence in the licensees. Uh, what we've been doing for the past 14, 15 months is all the stuff that we were not trained on and uh, you know had to figure out along the way and some of that will will continue for sure we're you know not completely out of this understood uh, but I think the territory uh, ahead is more familiar um, yeah. and what people have been trained to do Any questions Commissioner O'Brien I, I do I just had one question for um both for, for the gaming agency and GEU, we've had two different timing requests 
in terms of if we're going to be rescinding the COVID restrictions, one being 12.01 a.m., one being 9 a.m.? Is there a problem one time versus the other or having an inconsistent time? Like North, I don't know if lifting it at 12.01 a.m. is gonna create issues for you messaging wise or vice versa. So if there's ideally one time it's being lifted as to everyone or does it matter? Yeah. I don't think it affects us one way or the other. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, we'll adjust to whatever the, the time frame the commission agrees on uh, accordingly. So, uh, that's, that's how Brian, our, our, um, our reason for going kind of earlier in that, that on Saturday morning rather than at 1201 was just to kind of set an expectation for our guests. Um, you know, we didn't right. want to create the expectation that, you know, bars are fully open, 1201, come in. You know, um, we wanted time to be able to adjust to that and get our team ready and all those types of things. So we felt like that was an appropriate uh, time frame for us here at Plain Ridge. Right. And so I guess I would put that out to uh, Encore and MGM because I know when we were talking about shutting down initially, there was talk about it being easier to do at the end of the gaming day rather than the middle of what might be, you know, peak time and whether it makes more sense to do it four or five o'clock in the morning or something as opposed to at 12.01 on a Friday night. I don't, I don't believe we, we feel strongly either way, but we, I, on balance, would like the flexibility of the 12.01. I think we may, I think like North at Penn, we likely would not um, reopen the bars until the following evening, but we may look to activate slot machines, um, you know, mm -hmm. which are open 24 hours throughout that evening, um, assuming we go through all the necessary steps with IEB and, and, and Bruce and his team. So uh, we would prefer 12 a.m., but I don't anticipate that that means operationally we will, uh, or 12 1 a.m., I should say. I don't think that means operationally that we would pull the switch on every amenity at that time, other than perhaps uh, slot machines that are been fully vetted. And I, I think we're in the same position. What we plan to do is sort of start the work at 12.01 a.m. There's a lot of preparation that goes into to doing everything. Um, we, we were thinking of potentially walking around with champagne. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, there's a great deal of excitement. Um, and so maybe, it, it's certainly not a full, you know, every restaurant's open and, and the bars are a go, but some little bit of celebration uh, around 12.01. Okay, okay. Um, Commissioner Cameron, do you have questions? Nothing additional, thank you. Commissioner Zuniga? Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, uh, Loretta and um, Bruce and Captain Connors for that. Um, not surprisingly, they are prepared and, and um, not overwhelmed. So we know that uh, things should proceed smoothly. And Captain Connors, we, we um, welcome continuing reporting directly here and, of course, through IEB. So thank you. Um, so with that said, We've, um, we've heard um, from the three licensees. I think all of you have had the opportunity to, to detail your plans. Um, perhaps, Commissioner O'Brien, you have noted that we would want to be thoughtful about how our motion, with, uh, a motion uh, to uh, effectuate these plans needs to be carefully worded. Um, I don't know if we're prepared to think about a motion now. Commissioners, yes. Perhaps Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to take a lead there? Or are you prepared? I don't want to put you on the spot either. Um, I believe so. I, I'm so I can certainly, um, open to anyone else who, if they want to make the motion, or if we need to amend it as we go. There's a, a number of them that would have to be included, and then some of the conditions that I think we've all agreed would still be present uh, in the short term. Right, and I guess my question is this. We have three orders that are, um, they're orders that we have imposed mm -hmm. um, uh, that are outlined in the agenda. In order to effectuate the change that each licensee has requested, it's my understanding, Loretta, that we would have to lift those, those three orders 
and I suppose we could do them individually, or I suppose we could do them as a whole. Maybe it makes sense to do them individually. Then, we, then we would have a clean slate, and we would be um, restriction COVID restriction free for our three licensees. Is that correct, Loretta? That's that correct. Point, that's right. Those three documents are the universe of your restrictions. So lifting them, they would have no restrictions from, from the commission. Well, except that we would be lifting them subject to um, the handle of sort of conditions that have been agreed to. Yeah, exactly. We have, have a subject to the discussions present, the plans presented today. Is that right. It? Right. Um, and so then I think, commissioners, you'd want to think about subject to um, and, and I suppose um, we could we could do it um, individually for each facility, um, or we could I mean, do I it. Think, I think we can do an omnibus. I just think okay, if we good. do it subject right. to the, the conditions that were talked about today, and then if anyone wants to add another condition, something right. clarifications. Okay, so that's we're imagining it the same way. So. Um, um. And, and for, if, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, and for the question relative to the timing, mm -hmm. it could be worded in a way, Commissioner O'Brien, that it is no earlier no than, than, right. than 1201 and at the discretion of the, of the right. licensee, correct? That's right. So, so the, the orders are rescinded at 1201 and then it's going to be up to the individual facilities to message what that means no, and, and I expressed it. and I'm hearing from GEU and, and the gaming agents that they don't any the licensees they don't foresee that as any sort of issue so so I guess now before we go into the motion stage commissioners do either of you imagine adding or, or ask or discussing a condition um, that has not been addressed in the plans presented by the licensees, because I think we would want to chew on those. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, I see a no from you. Commissioner Zuniga. I, I, um, I don't imagine an extra condition. Perhaps it bears repeating for the record, either prior to the motion or support of the motion, what the current conditions or reporting are. And so in terms of the reporting, um, is there something in addition to what, because what I'm trying to avoid is the notion that if we're adding on to something that they addressed, you know, doing it to for one item versus the others can do. What may be helpful is reading my understanding of what the conditions would be. And that way, if the licensees have any objection or confusion or comment they want to make before we move, we can have that conversation now rather than after the motion has been made. I agree with that. So my understanding based on what's been presented in the conversation is that the potential motion would be to lift the three prior COVID restriction orders, but subject to the conditions that the licensees will conduct business in accordance with all COVID-19 related orders or advisories issued by the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that remain in effect, as well as any applicable CDC guidelines that the licensees will ensure that a pandemic safety officer remains in place until further notice, that the licensees will continue to report any positive COVID-19 tests related to the gaming establishment to the IEB and their respective local boards of health, and that they continue to work cooperatively with the IEB to ensure that the relevant guidance and practices above are being followed. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Okay. And I'm not hearing anything from the licensees, so it seems like there's no misunderstanding in terms of what the obligations would be going forward. Yeah, and I would just note for the record that I, I'm not sure that all those conditions needed to be articulated because I thought that they had reached that by agreement in their, their plans, uh, but I might have been missing something. I, I, I did think they all, they all agreed to in their plans, and so my I, only concern about individualizing any conditions is the idea that that one is more important than another. You know, for instance, it's, we don't mention masks in that. Well, because that's incorporated in the gu in the CDC and the governor's yes. guidance advisories. That's the language that would then incorporate that. Yes. 
So I saw it, I saw it as they agreed to do it, but we're also putting it as a condition of lifting the restrictions. Because at some point we would probably go forward and say, um, you know what, we're waiving your, the requirement that you have the pandemic safety officer that you makes, you know, any COVID related um, disclosures to, you know, IEB, et cetera. In the short term for my comfort level to lift the restrictions, I would want those as a condition going forward until we've gone a little bit further into this. So the motion would be that it's subject to the plans as presented, consistent with the plans presented with an emphasis on those particular conditions which Jay Ball agreed to do anyway. Right. Do we have a motion? Commissioner O'Brien. Um, so Madam Chair, uh, for the reasons discussed here today and included in the packet, I move that the following three commission orders uh, be rescinded effective 12.01 a.m. on May 29th, 2021. First, the June 23rd, 2020 order entitled Minimum Requirements for the Initial Phase Three Opening of Gaming Establishments. Second, the October 8th, 2020 order entitled Minimum Requirements for the Reintroduction of Roulette at Category 1 Gaming Establishments. And third, the March 11th, 2021 order entitled Minimum Requirements for one, expanding blackjack style tables to include a fourth player position, and two, the reintroduction of craps at the category one gaming establishments. These orders will be rescinded subject to the following conditions that have been agreed to by the gaming licensees. One, they shall conduct business in accordance with all COVID-19 related orders and advisories issued by the governor for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that remain in effect as well as any applicable CDC guidelines Second, that the licensees will ensure that a pandemic safety officer remains in place until further notice. Third, the licensees will continue to report any positive COVID-19 tests related to the gaming establishment to the IEB and their respective local boards of health. And four, that the licensees continue to work cooperatively with IEB to ensure that the relevant guidance and practices are being followed. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four to zero. Okay, so I think we're all set on item number two. Um, Loretta, thank you. And thank you thank to you. Bruce and Captain Connors. And most of all, thank you to the licensees. I wish you great um, luck uh, over the course of this big weekend, um, most of all we can all pause and reflect on the losses that occurred the last 15 months. Um, they've been enormous across the country, around the world, and here in Massachusetts. And for those you know, that whose lives have been forever affected, we think of them. And now um, you know, we really are hoping that this is, again, a sustainable re reopening for you all. And we wish you uh, the very best and wish all the patrons and employees much health and safety. So thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to item number three, uh, racing division. Dr. Lightbound. Good afternoon. Uh, just reflecting that it was about 11 months ago that we put these COVID plans into effect. Um, I wanna thank the racing and simulcast licensees the horsemen and our um, MGC racing staff for being nimble this past year and cooperative. Um, it was a lot to add on the COVID um, protocols in addition to our regular regulatory environment. Uh, so with that, I'll um, turn it over to Steve O'Toole to give an update on uh, the PPC COVID plans for racing and simulcasting. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, Madam Chair. and, and Commissioners, um, I would just like to uh, kind of uh, say the same thank you and, and acknowledge some people that uh, have been acknowledged in the past, but this time kind of on the racing side. Uh, Alex's staff and and uh, uh, her, her employees who uh, toiled through the uh, uh, pandemic restrictions and uh, making sure that people were doing what they needed to do. Uh, my racing staff, which was uh, very cooperative in enforcing all the restrictions, the Horsemen and the Horsemen's Association, 
uh, our simulcast customers and our racing fans as well. They were very cooperative uh, with all the uh, with all the stuff that was going on last year. <clears throat> um, with that being said, uh, racing the, the, on the simulcast side, the racing customers uh, flow through the casino. So everything that North uh, updated you with earlier is, an, is it will still be in effect. The pandemic officer. Uh, the uh, mask wearing with the uh, guidelines set forth by the CDC, our, our local officials, the Department of Health, and uh, any governor's orders that, that come out. So we'll be following that as well. Uh, in the racing area, the cleaning and, and disinfecting that's been going on will, will stay in effect. The plexiglass dividers between our paramutual clerks and our customers will remain uh, in place uh, for the time being. Uh, and we'll monitor that uh, with our employees, uh, with our paramutual clerks, as well as our customers, and, and, and lift those at the time when, when we feel that it's probably uh, prudent. But for the time being, they're, they're going to stay in place. And as well as, um, as you know, uh, racing, uh, we, minors are allowed in the racing area. Uh, paramutual wagering is 18 plus. Uh, but for the time being, we're going to stick with the 21 plus uh, uh, age uh, requirement in the racing area um, to stay consistent with the rest of the property and to, property and to, and to, continue, to continue to monitor all entrances into the racing, uh, racing area or the casino in the racing area. <clears throat> um, occupancy, of course, in the, in the racing area would, would, would want to go to 100 uh, percent. All self-serve wagering terminals uh, will be made operational. Uh, the restrictions regarding consumption of food and alcohol uh, no longer be in, in effect. And uh, food and beverage outlets located in the racing areas inside uh, would, uh, would be opened at, a, at some time in the future, at a future, at a future date. As, as North mentioned, the outside area will be made available uh, for uh, food and beverage. Um, uh, different than the other two uh, racing licensees, uh, we have live racing and a, a third element, uh, our horsemen. And uh, so on the backside during live racing, again, uh, you know, the, uh, all, all the advisories that come out will, will be strictly followed. Um, we'll continue to clean and, and disinfect uh, the, the way we have been. And as a matter of fact, in that area, because of some of the contagious uh, equine d diseases that have uh, been problematic in the past, we will continue to d disinfect. So we were actually doing that before uh, the, the COVID uh, hit, uh, but that was for the safety of the horses, not so much the people. Uh, but all that will continue. Our race paddock, uh, the setup will remain, so that'll still be socially distanced. It's been working out well, and we're gonna, uh, let that remain for the rest of the racing season. Uh, we would like to uh, take off the restrictions for owners being allowed in the paddock. That was a, that was a restriction that was put on in order to keep the uh, the, the occupancy down in, in in the paddock area. But it is expansive, and uh, uh, owners uh, would like to let them back into the into the uh, paddock. Uh, we'd like to also take the restrictions off the winter circle and let the owners and friends uh, gather for uh, that cel celebratory moment in the winter circle. And also uh, the driver's locker room uh, would be made available to the drivers only. Um, we will be on the honor system as, as uh, North had mentioned earlier uh, it, on the backside and our, pandem our pandemic officer, uh, as North had mentioned, will also be involved if there should be any reporting or any issues back there. Um, I think I hit on all the all the things that uh, that come up as far as uh, racing and our concerns in racing uh, goes. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to to answer them. Questions. I'll start with Commissioner Cameron. Thank you, um, Mr. O'Toole. Um, just. It sounds like a lot of uh, planning and a lot of thought went into this plan. It sounds really prudent. Um, could you explain a little bit why you decided or your team decided to keep the plexiglass in place? Sure, we don't have, uh, we, we did have a couple of tellers that uh, were very um, outspoken when mm -hmm. we first started about, you know, hey, this customer isn't wearing their mask, this guy. So they were very sensitive to the exposure level. 
Um, and while it's difficult for them to take the wages through the plexiglass, sometimes there's some miscommunication uh, with the customers, uh, but we're gonna uh, kind of wait and, and see how they feel about lifting that um, uh, going forward. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, at the time when, uh, when we're really out of the woods, uh, that might be the time for them, or they might want to, uh, they might decide that it's, it's, it's time earlier. But for now, um, because of that concern that our tellers showed early on, you know, it's there, it doesn't hinder them too much. And so uh, we're going to wait for the tellers to uh, actually give us some feedback and our customers give us some feedback on uh, how, how they perceive that as far as, you know, as far as they're concerned with their health and their safety. Excellent. So it's concern for your staff um, that really um, that really drove that decision. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Steve, um, remind us um, for the rest of the area in the in the very mutual um, um, bedding and live racing uh, in, indoors. Um, Remind me, did you install any plexiglass that you're now removing or did, did you um, uh, decrease the number of tables to create the social distancing that you are now uh, adjusting to full occupancy or both? What, 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 was, uh, what, what were you restoring? So we, uh, we, we, we installed plexiglass at the teller stations only. Yes. Uh, we turned off many uh, terminals. Uh, those terminals will be uh, turned back on. Uh, on our teller line, um, the terminals, if the teller is not using them, they can be flipped up for, uh, for a customer to, to use it self-serve. We also have a, uh, an area downstairs in racing where the terminals line up side by side. So I think there's about seven or eight of them side by side. We went with every other one. So we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be putting back those, uh, uh, those, those uh, terminals, terminals. those self-serve terminals back into operation. Uh, we removed uh, tables uh, to make the social distancing. We'll be bringing back some of that. And uh, we also removed the bar seating uh, along the windows as well as, you know, at the bar. Uh, so we didn't remove it all along the windows. We moved everything from the bar, but along the windows we removed about every third seat, about a, uh, one, two out of every three seats to give more distance along the uh, bar window seating. So uh, some of that will be coming back. Okay, thank you. Michelle uh, Bryan? I do. Steve, the same way that the, I don't know if you were on the meeting when the, um, the other licensees were talking about the overall restrictions and they talked about keeping in place certain tables, like maybe, you know, one table of each gaming, you know, table game so that somebody, if they felt more comfortable that way, or the person's, you know, not vaccinated fully. And so they're masking up and they have to still comply with those COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, you just described how you're going to be taking some things down and going back to normal. Are you going to be keeping at least some socially distanced so that if you have someone not fully vaccinated or someone not comfortable, they have the option? Yes. Yeah, that option's always available. We have self-serve terminals that are that are standalone. Uh, okay. There's about six of them that are standalone downstairs in the grandstand area, as well as upstairs in the in the teletheater. Uh, standalone, they're uh, 20 feet or more from from each other. So uh, okay. those options are available even in non-restricted uh, times. And is there going to be any? I'm sure that your customers are probably familiar with that. But is there any signage or anything that so that people understand they've got that option? If they're looking for it uh we could make the signage uh there isn't any, any signage there but it's it's kind of obvious that they're out in the open and uh they're not hidden they're out in the open where, where people can see them and they're just standalone mm -hmm. but we could we could definitely direct people to them okay thank you so I just want to thank you, uh, Steve, Mr. O'Toole, for your ongoing uh, leadership and commitment uh, these last 15 months. Um, it has been extraordinary, and, and I know that you um, have worked in such a cooperative fashion with uh, the Gaming Commission, and particularly Dr. Lightbound, and for that, we thank you. And we thank the, um, 
Thank you. And we thank the horse racing community too. It was a very big adjustment and we remember it was, they, they were leading um, as our, you know, the, the, the patrons of, of, um, of really the gaming industry because they came back early. And so, um, you know, the, in the, in the drivers and every, every individual who made horse racing successful at that time, um, really we applaud their efforts and dedication um, and their compliance. Uh, and to Dr. Lightbound, of course, we know that it wasn't without some effort on your part to ensure the compliance and, and for that we appreciate it. Um, I just, I, I, I don't think you've touched on this and it really is a little bit separate and apart from your um, obligations, uh, Steve, but I thought maybe we'd address the MGC dedicated space, Dr. Lightbound, because if I understand right now, get the license inside and that you were accommodating outside. Um, and now um, our, our space is, isn't, our space is subject to different rules. So I don't know if, you'll, if, if you, um, if, if that's been, those details have been ironed out a little bit more. Dr. Lightbound. I've talked to Steve briefly about it, and then um, I also um, have been in communication with Troopty, our you know HR director, and with uh, Loretta Lelos, Director Lelos, on um, that issue as well. Um, we do have plexiglass that Plainridge put up for us in there, so we'll keep, like Steve was saying, for his um, folks, we'll keep our plexiglass up as well. And um, what we may do is. Um, instead of completely restricting people from coming in to the building, um, which obviously if they need to drop money off, they, they come in very briefly, but we might do something like have people come one in at a time. Um, as you all have seen, our vestibule in there is, is um, kind of small and um, I'm not sure people are comfortable crowding into a small space like that yet. Um, but I'm going to um, continue to have talks with um, our HR department and um, with Steve O'Toole. And because obviously he has staff in that building too. Um, anecdotally, um, from what I gather, people, you know, water cooler talk, um, all of the staff in that building has at least had their first vaccine. And so they feel very comfortable among each other um, if the, you know, masks are lifted. But um, you know, there is some concern about, um, you know, dealing with the public. Um, the one thing that I did notice that's good, all of the um, New England states are, um, and, in, and then if you also add in New York and New Jersey, they're all at or um, above 70% on people having their first vaccines. And, you know, we draw um, racing um, horsemen from, you know, the New England states and New Jersey and New York every day basically. So um, I feel a little better knowing that those states that we draw from um, do seem to be having a high rate of vaccination. So um, just to clarify, and again, um, uh, maybe uh, Karen, you can also chime in. Where there's an overlap in order to accomplish race, horse racing and all the, the functionalities, um, our, our HR rules apply and the public would have to comply with them. And so we may just want to clarify that, and I don't know if that also goes into the communication plans. Besides um, the building, the white building, as I refer to it, um, there's other space with the, um, that, where we have MGM, um, MGC, I'm sorry, um, employees. Is that? In the, in the test barn and the test barn office, um, the barn itself can, uh, I would assume is considered outdoors. Um, there is a small office, which would be indoors. And then um, the uh, judges, when they're judging the races are up in the judges booth. And so those three spaces are designated as MGC uh, spaces for purposes of our HR. Karen, I'm gonna have you chime in there. Yeah, 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 that, that's correct. So whatever, uh, so the, the commission uh, internal policy for our internal operations would apply to that and we can make uh, specific uh, requirements for that area. For example, the plexiglass in between the, the judges or whatever, whatever uh, provision, we can keep those. 
Um, but as far as the public entering, this is sort of our government space, so we couldn't uh, request you know, have requirements uh, for folks that are doing business with our employees. As of uh, May 29th, the requirements are what? Um, that for the out, uh, the public would have to keep masks on. Is that if correct? they're not vaccinated, correct. Okay. As a, okay. At, as of May 29th. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, assuming that, so that's in compliance with the the governor's um, advisory and CDC guidance. But we haven't adopted that yet for our- Right, group. right. So I think that's something we need to discuss before the 15th. Um, and right. so probably at the next meeting, what internally we're looking to do. So we're looking at that internally as far as, uh, you know, looking at best practices and other government agencies, what is everybody else doing? What are we doing for our own employees? So we'll be looking at that. And I think that should be something for the, uh, another commission discussion. Yeah, so I guess that's just for my purposes right now. So on May 29th, employee, if the public is going into any of that space, would we expect them to wear masks regardless of vaccination until we examine those HR? Or do we need to address that today? Um, I'm, I, yeah. Because we haven't had, we haven't really addressed our own HR policy. I don't know, commissioners, if I, I would feel comfortable for right now until we, we um, revise that in, after careful consideration, that policy that that just stands and that for right now, the short amount of time that when they walk into um, our space that they just be asked to mask. Uh, but I'm, I'm open. I'm just I'm wondering, I'm wondering, Madam Chair, if that would be difficult if the whole you know, paddock area has one set of rules, but yet our small space up front, which is right next to the outdoor space, we have a separate rule. Maybe, um, maybe Dr. Light um, can speak to that. So for um, right now, the um, office of the test barn, um, we're not having the horsemen come in to sign the evidence cards. They stand right outside of the office so they can observe the sample being sealed and all still and they sign the card outside of the office. So that, that probably um, is fine to be without a mask if they've been vaccinated um, because they are outdoors still and um, we can just, uh, you know, keep our internal, our staff that's in there, you know, they um, wouldn't be exposed to um, the, uh, out, the public basically, if you say that. Um, so that, that can, can keep going as it is until the commission comes up with um, further guidance. And then um, with the uh, um, office space, um, it's, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. We do have um, plenty of masks um, that we've purchased that we could, um, you know, uh, keep a supply right at the door so that if um, a horseman needed to come in the office and didn't have a mask, we can give them one. Um. It, it may be helpful to uh, hear from uh, Derek Lennon because he has been in contact with folks in the executive branch on this. I don't know, Kathy, if you'd like to hear some, that may tie into some of this conversation if it's helpful. And so the, the narrow issue is, is really technical. Right. Uh, because um, we haven't adopted different rules for our own environment. And so, uh, Derek, you know, how do, we, how do we address this for at least a short term? Uh, so if, we, if I just want to give a point of reference. If we require masks in our space, we will be inconsistent with what the executive branch is doing as of the 29th. The executive branch, um, and the governor has been pretty clear about this on his communications as well, has been we're going to use the honor system, um, and you know we're we're not going to police on masks. Um, it's up to people, and I understand the casinos are doing differently because they um, have, especially for some of their own employees, because as the governor has pointed out, they are um, private entities and they can make up their own rules. I'm just saying we would be inconsistent 
with what the executive branch is doing. And as an employer, we also have um, the ability being outside of the executive branch to make different rules. I'm just giving you a point of reference. Um, and I think it all comes down to comfort level for the uh, for all the commissioners as well as for our for our own staff. Um, I know so that right, right now in terms of our own policy, like if if we were to work go to work on in the office on whatever day it is, June second or June first, I guess maybe Tuesday. Um, what is what is our policy? As of right now, we have not changed the policy right. to, to comport with the governor's That's order right. or the governor's change. I think Derek's point is we should note there's a little there's a little discrepancy yeah. there, and and but we have the authority to do that. It's just to note that it's different, uh, and we may want to address that. Does that make sense, Derek? And, and then, uh, and so a member of the public, if a member of the public came to our offices at at one on Federal Street, they are asked, they would be expected to have a mask on right now. And then until we give further notice, do, and I just am wondering, so I just am wondering about the public piece. This is just, it's, it's a little bit, there's been a little bit of different, um, I think there's some consternation about suddenly having the public come into our, our MGC space and we haven't had a chance to really discuss that. Um, my point is that we haven't had a point to discuss it. I'm not sure today we're prepared to, to change that. And so, Correct. but I understand the, 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 you know, Commissioner Cameron's point too. Um, I, I need a recommendation, I think, uh, or, and maybe Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Zuniga, you want to chime in, but maybe we get a, a recommendation from Karen and, and uh, Derek. I mean, I personally think we leave it as is till we have time to talk about it. You've got different private establishments that are doing different rules and are gonna to continue to do so. There's a number of businesses near me that are gonna to continue to require masks. They don't wanna get into the honor system. It's a small space, um, particularly when we're talking about a small space right here. I think we keep going until we have a chance to, if you, you know, if we wanna put this on the agenda for the next meeting to really talk about it in the short term, I think the better thing to do is to maintain it until we have time to- And Karen, that was the item. Okay, okay, yeah. There you go. For our agenda meeting, there, there it is. There it is. And that was the item I could not remember for our agenda okay. meeting um, on our own internal. Um, so, and that may be an issue, you know, if that's the approach, an issue of signage and notice, putting, you know, making sure something's on the door, or something like that, so there's no confusion. So we don't want our staff to have to deal with that. Commissioner Cameron, uh, I think we should apologies. talk about it. No, I think we should talk about it as soon as possible. And I guess that okay. would be next week. June 3rd? June 3rd? So, yes, yeah, because right. I think we need to be consistent. And right. I, um, I, uh, I think that there will be confusion if state government is doing one thing and we're doing something else. So I think next week's meeting would be the appropriate time to talk about it. Yes, and, and Commissioner Cameron, my apologies, but that is exactly the item that Karen and I had spoken about. Yes. Yeah. And I so know it I'll, was yeah. I'll, I'll coordinate with Marianne to add that to the agenda. I think Marianne's on this message on this <laughs> meeting as well. So. so for this very short period of time, um, for consistency purposes, um, it sounds as though it's not going to be a big practical problem because a lot of the um, a lot of the operations have occurred outside of the space anyway. Um, I, Dr. Lightbound. Okay. And it, it'll really, if we get it on the uh, Thursday's agenda, it'll really only affect racing on Monday and Tuesday. So, does that make sense to you, Commissioner Zunica? Okay. Yeah, um, uh, it, it makes total sense. Uh, keep us is until further discussion. So that means that for June third, uh, Derek and Karen will need to be prepared for some recommendations with the troopies input, of course, on on um, the internal guidelines, workspace. Commissioner Cameron, I know that you've been part of that um, that restart group. Thank you. Um, so I didn't mean to derail our questions from Mr. O'Toole, to, and he's still here, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of other questions for Steve, um, I'm, I'm very satisfied with 
with the plan um, that was presented and the expectations. Any further questions that I need a, a hand? Commissioner Cameron. I have no questions. I am as well uh, thought that the plan was really um, well, well thought out, well articulated, and um, I have no concerns. Commissioner O'Brien. No, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Senator. All set. Thank you. Okay. So, um, would it make the best sense for us to address the horse racing separate and apart, I think, from simulcasting? I think I'm understanding simulcasting is completely covered by our action. Is this fair? Um, I'm looking for Loretta and, uh, and Todd. Is it fair to say that our last action um, with respect to PPC covers the si simulcasting, or maybe we'll address that in the next discussion. In terms of horse racing, the lifting of, um, we approved a plan. The plan wasn't included in the packet, but we all remember it. And um, we would move to lift that approval. Do we need to do that? or? How, would we, how should we best proceed, Todd? You'll recall that each of the racing licensees had their own um, uh, reopening plans that the commission approved. This is um, for horse racing and not simulcasting. Yeah. Well, it was both. They, yeah. I think each of the three had their own plans. They were obviously different because they have different venues um, and different oh. services when it comes to PPC. But as a general matter, as opposed to the commission having a uniform plan that applied to them all, uh, they were allowed to submit their own plans and the commission reviewed and approved them ultimately. So those are the, the three individual plans that need uh, to be addressed. What if we um, decided to act right now on, on um, Plain Ridge? I think that that's... What, um, do we need to affirmatively lift our prior approval How, what, in order to allow them to proceed? What would you recommend? The plan that I envisioned was that the commission would vote to allow um, PPC to withdraw its reopening plan that was previously approved and replace it with whatever conditions or agreements um, were reached between the commission and the licensee. So you've heard that um, Mr. O'Toole just presented his plan. Do you have any recommendation in terms of additional conditions that we would need to add? No, I thought his, his plan was very thorough. I think it's actually, in my mind, uh, the conditions to be agreed upon would be very similar to the ones the commission just reviewed with reference to the gaming establishments as a whole. Um, so the uh, pandemic safety officer reporting to the racing division, uh, reporting to the local board of health, all of these considerations you previously discussed, I think equally apply on the racing side. And again, just noted that they did put that in as their plan. So I don't really see it as a condition, but I'm, I'm happy if that's necessary, but I do see that they presented it as a plan um, and I'm, I'm prepared to accept the plan as presented. Um, but uh, I think we should probably work on um, Mr. Tools before we go to the other um, presenters. We agree. Commissioner Cameron, do you- I'm happy to make a motion. Thank you. Um, for the- um, Reasons discussed today, I move that the commission allow the racins, racing licensee, Plain Ridge Park Casino, to um, rescind their respective commission approved COVID-19 related reopening plan, provided as follows. They shall conduct business in accordance with all COVID-19 related orders issued by the governor and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that remain in effect, as well as any applicable CDC guidance. Uh, they will ensure that the uh, pandemic officer remain in place until further notice. 
Uh, they will report any positive COVID-19 tests related to the racing facility to the director of racing and the respective local board of health. And they will continue to work cooperatively with the racing division to ensure that all the relevant guidance and practices are being followed. Second back. Uh, if I could just offer one amendment, which is that after the reference to the common, any orders out of the Commonwealth, that it be orders or advisories, just the same language we used in connection with the casinos. Good point. I second as amended. My, my only concern, I'll just note it, is that I think that the process for both this and, and the other is that by not also accepting their plan, we may have missed some of their additional um, you know, items that they were including um, that go beyond the guidance from um, the, the governor. Um, but I, I, I'm understanding today that all three, all of the licensees who are coming forward plan to comply fully with their, the plans as presented. So I'm fine with the motions as, as being presented. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and understand uh, their intent. Do I have um, any other further edits or discussions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you. And thank you for the very comprehensive plan. I appreciate all the details very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank, thank you. Very much. And good good luck. Um, it's a big weekend. So good luck and stay safe, Steve, and, and good luck to all the, the drivers and, and the, the horse racing community. Thank you. Okay, and Dr. Lightbound, thank you. We'll look forward to helping you out on June 3rd on the, the, the space. All right, so now, Dr. Lightbound, we're going to move forward um, with who's up next? Uh, Raina, um, okay. Sue Rodriguez, the Assistant General Manager, is on. Um, I'm not sure if um, Mr. Carney, the owner and general manager, is on as well also, but um, now I'll turn it over um, to um, Ass Assistant General Manager Rodriguez to talk about Raynham's plans. Um, I'm not sure if she's muted. So she's attending by phone? Yes. Um, um, we might be able to get some help from. Do you know the number, Alex? Um, or the last four digits? Yeah, it, 4071. Okay. Um, with Raynham, sometimes it goes through a different um, number. They have many numbers, but that's their main number 508 824 4071. I'm looking here. Alex, um, if she, if uh, Karen can't find her, she could do, um, I think it's star, I think it's pound three to unmute herself on the phone. Or okay. No longer star six. Star six, it used to be. I don't know if it changed. Uh, okay, I might be thinking of something else, so you may be right. Yeah. Be star six. Let's try star six, Sue, so if you can hear us. Um, I, um, Austin, I don't know if you're able to search for that number with your co <laughs> There we Hello, go. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, great, great. Good afternoon. On behalf of Mr. George Carney and myself, I'd like to thank the Massachusetts Gaming Commission for your support over the past nearly 15 months. Long 15 months. Special thanks to Dr. Lightbound for always being very supportive and responsive. And a special thank you, uh, although thank you doesn't seem enough to our employees who have been so dedicated and cooperative throughout the process. <clears throat> Based on the recommendations from Governor Charles Baker, Raynham Park requests the permission of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to return to full operations on May 29th, 2021, with the exception of updated mask wearing guidelines. All our employees and guests will be advised to wear a mask at all times in our facility and to practice social distancing unless they have been fully vaccinated. Information regarding mask guidelines will be communicated through signage throughout the property, flyers available at our entrance, and printed in our program booklets as well as displayed on our Facebook page and website. 
Employees will receive written notification of all of the information I am sharing with you today. We will keep the pandemic safety officer in place until further notice and continue to report positive COVID-19 cases to the local board of health and the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Some of the key areas of interest for us for resuming operations in place prior to March 18th, 2020 being requested are to return seating at all bars, allow full bar service, including walk-up service where guests can move up about the facility with beverages and consume while standing. We will return additional self-service wager wagering machines as needed, and there'll still be areas with self-service machines offering social distance. We will reconfigure the seating to allow for additional tables and chairs in accordance with, in accordance with our occupancy limits, but we will not need to return all tables and chairs. That's not necessary at this point. So there will be highly visible socially distanced seating. Many of the changes that we adopted during the pandemic will remain in place, including, but not limited to the use of a privately contracted cleaning company for cleaning and disinfecting all bathrooms and high touch areas before, during, and after business hours, as well as daily deep cleaning. We will keep the hand sanitizer dispensers placed throughout the property, and we will maintain the plexiglass barriers at the Paramutual Lines program stand, and we did install a glass barrier around our concession stand. Those will remain in place. After conversations with our employees when we reopened, everyone seemed to appreciate those and felt as if that's something that they wished they had always had. So we will be keeping those. So signage with regard to frequent and proper hand washing, use of hand sanitizer, proper wearing of masks, to stay at home when you're feeling sick, to avoid touching your face and how to sneeze to minimize droplet dispersal will continue to be posted throughout the facility. We will continue the use of one designated entrance and exit and continually reinforce the policy of, if you are sick, please stay home to all our employees and guests. We look forward to returning to our pre-COVID operations while keeping the health and safety of our employees and guests our foremost priority. We will continue to monitor directives from federal, state, and local governments and agencies such as the CDC and the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. This is our proposed plan, and I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank, thank you, Sue, and thank you for the comprehensive plan. Um, I'm gonna ask each commissioner if they have any questions for you. And again, thank you for your compliance over the last uh, 15 months. As you say, they were difficult, and thank you for your continued cooperation in, in coordination with Dr. Lightbound. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner O'Brien, you want to go first? No, I think it's a very thought out way to reopen and go back to normal and keep what was good about the other restrictions. So I, I don't have any questions at this time. Okay. So just to be clear, this plan, like the other plans, do include keeping um, in place restrictions that um, are being lifted by the, the governor's uh, order and advisory. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Zuniga. Sorry, thank you. Um, just uh, something I may have missed, uh, or just to reemphasize, um, you, you're planning on putting back some tables, but not the ones you had prior to the pandemic. Uh, is that correct, Sue? That is correct. We, we've always, well, since the loss of live racing, we seem to have an abundance of seating. So this allows guests, to, with what we've removed and allowing the six feet, it has allowed us to give space between the guests. And if, if it's not necessary, there's no need to return it. We will return. There are certain seats, as you know, especially gamblers like their certain seats. We'll, we will be returning some of the seat, seating to the window tables, even though they have nothing to look at out the window as far as racing anymore, they still love the window seats. So we, we will be returning some seating there, but in, in short, we, we won't need to return all of the seating. Definitely all of the seating at the bars, but not throughout the property. All right, yeah, thank you. 
You're welcome. Mr. Cameron. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Roger. Ms. Rodriguez, I had a question about, um, I wasn't clear when you talked about your mask policy, you talked about um, requiring masks of staff and uh, patrons unless they're fully vaccinated. Is that, did I hear that correct? Correctly? Correct. That's correct. Okay. And that will be on the honor system? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Well thought out plan, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I guess I just have this question, Sue. Uh, we asked of I asked, I think, um, earlier. Are you encountering staffing challenges just because of the, the new environment, or are you all set as things reopen? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, Could you, you know, do? there's a consideration um, around labor shortages. Are you able to? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I think that's, unfortunately, that's a problem facing the whole state right now. Yes, we have been uh, facing some in our food service, but we have such dedicated, the mutual clerks, We've most of our employees have been here 30 plus years yes. and they've stayed with us and they're continuing to stay with us. So that's why we, we just can't say how much we appreciate them enough. Getting, acquiring new staff, a little bit tricky, but we're able to maintain our operations and we have been able to throughout this. So I'm not anticipating any issues, especially the paramutuals where it's such a skilled position, but we have, we have what we need in place. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. And I think what you noted that it really is statewide is, is just the observation I was questioning. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions um, with respect to Raynham? Um, Dr. Lightbound, do you want to add in anything? Oh, no, just uh, once again to, to thank um, them for their cooperation and being nimble on these plans. Great, thank you. So in terms of um, moving um, with respect to like, allowing the relief that Raynham is looking for at this time in light of the, the changes that are being um, ordered on May 29th. Do I have a motion or do we have further discussion? Okay, who would like to move? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move that, um, that the commission allow uh, the racing licensee Raynham Park to rescind their respective commission approved COVID-19 related reopening plan, provided that they shall conduct business in accordance with all COVID-19 related orders and advisories used, uh, issued by the governor and the Commonwealth of the Commonwealth that remain in effect, as well as any applicable CDC guidance. Uh, second, that uh, provided that they will ensure that a pandemic safety officer remains in place until further notice. Third, that they will report any positive COVID-19 tests related to the racing facility to the director of racing and the respective local board of health. And fourth, that they will continue to work cooperatively with the racing division to ensure that all relevant, relevant guidance and practices are being followed. Any discussion questions? Just a second. Okay. Commissioner uh, Kim? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. I vote yes, 4-0. Okay, Dr. Lightbound. Okay, so our next uh, licensee is Suffolk Downs and uh, Chip Tuttle, the COO is here today to speak on Suffolk's behalf. Chip? Thank you, Dr. Lightbound and uh, members of the commission. Uh, we too are very appreciative of the commission's thoughtful cooperation and guidance over the course of the last 15 months. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, <clears throat> lifting most of the COVID-19 restrictions that were part of our reopening plan in July of last year consistent with the governor's guidance. Um, 
I'm happy to take you through those briefly. Uh, certainly want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we uh, can also send this in a written form uh, if you'd like. Um, but uh, consistent with the, the governor's directive. You want. Take all the time you want. Okay. Um, consistent with the governor's directive, uh, we will no longer require customers who are fully vaccinated to wear face coverings, uh, though we will maintain a supply of them at the entrance and at a couple of other locations for those who may want to continue to wear them um, through signage and other public communication. We will advise non-vaccinated non customers of the need to wear a face covering and to maintain social distancing. Uh, and uh, I think we're on the honor system with that as well, as it appears everyone is. Um, similarly, employees will have the option to wear face coverings at their own discretion, uh, provided they are fully vaccinated. Non-vaccinated employees will be required to wear face coverings and to adhere to strict social distancing protocols until such time that they are fully vaccinated. Um, we have begun discussions on employee vaccination policy with uh, internally with our own management and with IBW Local 103, the union that represents the majority of our workforce. Um, we will update the commission at such time as we have uh, a definitive agreement on, on, on this. Um, for at least the next several weeks, we will maintain social distancing in, in bedding lines and, and food service lines and uh, we will keep the transparent plexiglass barriers at the teller operated bedding windows. Um, they are not, as Mr. O'Toole said, they're not really much of an impediment uh, to the process and uh, for reasons of um, customer and patron safety, we're, we're just gonna keep them up where, where they exist. Uh, we'll also maintain a six foot distance between mutual windows and self bet terminals and program kiosks. Um, there's it's all working very well with them spaced the way they are, so there's not necessarily any reason, right now at least, to, uh, to change that policy. Uh, we will continue to advise employees who do not, do not feel well to uh, not report to work. We will monitor any positive cases of COVID-19 among the workforce and notify the relevant public health officials um, uh, if we, we do have any additional cases. As part of this, uh, we too will be keeping our pandemic safety officer. Um, as far as sanitation uh, throughout the facility, uh, we will continue most of the enhanced sanitation protocols implemented as part of our plan in July of 2020, um, including the prominent placement and display of hand san sanitizing stations uh, and sanitizing wipes uh, throughout the facility regular cleaning and disinfecting of um, surfaces such as self bet kiosks and, and other areas where there's a lot of traffic. Hand washing stations will be maintained as well. Uh, in terms of capacity, uh, we, we have the luxury of a pretty significant capacity. Um, we will continue to operate the first and second floors uh, of the clubhouse building as our primary operations, the capacity, uh, the license capacity for each of those areas is 600 people. Uh, so we plan to go back to that fully licensed capacity. However, um, given the time of year, we do not anticipate that, that we would exceed that capacity. Uh, if we do exceed uh, that capacity or have additional need, uh, we continue to have the use of the outdoor area on the clubhouse apron, uh, both for food service and for overflow, uh, and the, um, the area on the second floor of the clubhouse outside of the Legends Bar and Grill uh, for overflow as well uh, on the chance we need additional capacity this summer. Uh, we will continue uh, social distancing of tables uh, and chairs in at least half of our dining areas uh, for those who are not fully vaccinated, um, you know, maintaining at least six feet between customers at these tables in these areas, um, we have the, uh, again, the luxury of some space to do that. Um, signage and public communication uh, on that front, uh, we'll have prominent signage at entrances and, and uh, elsewhere, reminding people who are not fully vaccinated to maintain social distancing and to wear face coverings. We will communicate with our customers by way of um, email and social media as well through our database and social channels 
So uh, that is our revised plan, and we appreciate, again, the commission's thoughtfulness and guidance. Uh, and uh, if we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, David Lanzilli, who's our pandemic safety officer, is also on the line as well. Um, and we look forward to uh, hopefully your, your approval of this revised plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tuttle, and thank you, too, for your continued cooperation with Dr. Lightbound and with the um, and all of the MGC's expectations. Commissioner Cameron, do you have a question for Mr. Tuttle? I did. Um, thank you for the plan. Very thoughtful, Mr. Tuttle. Um, you said you were going to keep up with most of the safety protocols. Uh, which, which ones did you deem were not necessary any, any longer? I, I think we're, we're maintaining almost everything except the capacity restrictions, right? We had originally gone to 50% and then 60% capacity. And, and, uh, and then obviously the masks for, you know, fully vaccinated people will not have to wear masks, but we're really keeping uh, the vast majority of, of a lot of the other things that we implement. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Brian? No, I'm all set. Thank you. I, I like that most of the spacing, you have the ability to do it. It's great. They're just going to continue with the spacing in the foreseeable future. I think it's going to be a pretty safe environment. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Sinica. Uh, no, same here. Thank you for the, for the summary, Chip. Thank you. Excellent. Commissioner Cameron, do you have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move um, that the Commission allow uh, the racing licensee located uh, at Suffolk Downs uh, to rescind their respective Commission approved COVID-19 related uh, reopening plans provided the following that they shall conduct business in, in accordance with all uh, COVID-19 related orders uh, and advisory uh, plans issued by the governor and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that remain in effect as well as applicable CDC guidance, um, that they ensure that the pandemic safety officer remains in place until further notice, and that they um, report any positive COVID-19 tests related to the racing facility to the director of racing and the respective local board of health and they continue to work cooperatively with the racing division to ensure that all relevant guidance and practices are being followed. Second. Okay, no further questions or comments or edits. Okay, Commissioner uh, Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. And uh, there you are, Chip. You moved on me. Thank you very, very much. And and we wish you much um, luck as as things open up and stay safe. And 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 we wish the same for your employees and your patrons. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Have Thank you. Day. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, we're moving on now to item uh, number four. Um, Todd and Jill. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners. Um, I had a chance to meet with each of you individually um, regarding the letter to the legislative leaders, Spilka and Mariano, and the chairs of the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight, Chairs Pacheco and Cabral. Um, and um, these letters support changes to the General Law 30A, Section 20D, um, regarding modernizing or an amendment to the law uh, requiring um, that members of a public body be physically present um, for quorum purposes. And, Do you think it might be helpful if we just let um, have Councillor Grossman just set the stage on on the, the letter. Because just pause sure. right where you are because I think it will just be helpful. Sure. Okay. Yes. 
Todd. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to, to jump in with an overview of uh, the open meeting law and where we stand uh, relative to its terms. And as Jill just mentioned, the core of the open meeting law is codified in uh, chapter 30A, section 20. It sets out the familiar requirements like uh, public notice of meetings, accessibility of meetings to the public, uh, presence of a quorum at uh, public meetings. It's important to note that the open meeting law requires public access to meetings, but not necessarily public participation, which is why uh, public access cable, for example, is an acceptable uh, medium for the broadcast of public meetings. Uh, the open meeting law, by its very terms, allows the attorney general to authorize remote participation uh, of a member of a public body as long as a quorum of the body, including the chair, are present at the meeting location. The attorney general, of course, has in fact authorized remote participation via a set of regulations, which are codified at 940 CMR 29.10. And it's important just to remember, of course, that uh, as far as uh, the commission's quorum is concerned, chapter 23K section 3D says that three commissioners shall constitute a quorum and the affirmative vote of three commissioners shall be required for an action of the commission. You're also likely familiar, of course, with those aid attorney general regs that provide for things like roll call votes um, for uh, remote participation, the requirement that meeting materials be distributed in advance, the announcement by the chair that someone is participating remotely, and you may also recall that remote participation under the attorney general regs and the statute is required, is allowed only if physical attendance of that particular uh, member would be unreasonably difficult. So there are certain uh, limitations on remote participation in the uh, body of the law and regulations. Of course, by executive order dated March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker suspended some of the open meeting law requirements and placed other measures in place to ensure the safety of all participants at public meetings, uh, given the pandemic, but also uh, designed to ensure the transparency in government decision-making that the open meeting law is designed to ensure. So things like notice and public access remained in place the whole time uh, during the course of this pandemic. But what the executive order did was to relax uh, two things, essentially. The requirement that a public meeting be conducted in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public, that was relaxed, of course, meaning that remote uh, 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 holding of uh, meetings was allowed, uh, provided that adequate alternative means of access, like remote collaboration technology, um, is done as long as there's no charge or toll or otherwise put in place for members of the public. And secondly, the executive order allowed remote participation by all members of a public body, uh, regardless of uh, need, and suspended the requirement that the chair and the quorum be physically present in the place of the public meeting. The governor's order by its own terms is effective until the state of emergency is terminated, which of course we now know is June 15th. So on Ju June 15th, that particular executive order will sunset and the regular open meeting law provisions as I have just described them and which you're familiar with will take effect once again, meaning that the chair and a quorum must be physically present at the meeting location and the location has to be uh, accessible to the public. By all indications though, the legislature and the governor are well aware of the fact that employment of that executive order to conduct uh, fully remote meetings has been a successful undertaking um, and a popular option of many public bodies. Um, and in many cases has actually ensured greater access uh, to the public, to the conduct of the public's business. And there are actually numerous legislative efforts underway to allow for continued remote participation in some fashion. Uh, there have been public reports uh, that we've uh, maybe seen that the governor will be filing essentially placeholder legislation to keep the principles of his executive order in place until September 1st, which will allow the legislature and his office an opportunity to consider more permanent amendments to the open meeting law 
um, to uh, uh, align with some of the principles that we've been following over the course of the past year plus. And there are actually three other pieces of legislation that are presently pending that will allow similar uh, principles and amendments to the open meeting law uh, moving forward. Um, so the bottom line though, is that as of today on, on June 15th, if no further action is taken uh, to amend the open meeting law, at least three commissioners, meaning a quorum, uh, will have to be, including the chair, would have to be present at the physical meeting location to conduct uh, public meetings. Though there is certainly, as I mentioned, uh, reason to believe that action will be taken prior uh, to that date. So as of today, we just have to stay tuned uh, for further developments, which we are closely monitoring, of course. So that's uh, just a, a, a quick overview of where we stand with the open meeting law and uh, attendant orders. One clarification, the chair can designate Right, um, under current law, um, the chair could make a designation. If, for instance, I was unable to be physically present, I could designate someone in my place. Correct, Don? Uh, I think, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done it once and I know it's done in the past. So. That, is, it's, that process is described in the Attorney General regulations. Yeah. I, I don't remember precisely what Yeah, I think that that's right, as long as, <clears throat> but the, the chair, whoever is chairing the meeting must be currently physically present. Yeah. Um, now, Jill, with that backdrop. Okay, that, that is a great backdrop. Thank you, yes. Todd. Um, I would just add, you know, and remind the commission and, and the general public um, how quickly the commission pivoted um, really seamlessly to 100% um, um, remote collaboration technology. And um, since um, the executive order was um, issued, the commission held more than 113 public meetings. Um, the feedback from our guests, um, you know, general public, speakers, licensees, um, were that it, um, it was a real positive. Um, they didn't have to take um, all the time out of their day to come into Boston. Um, and it allowed people from across the state and the country to participate um, more easily. Um, so, um, and what, uh, one more point I'll just mention um, is that it allowed us to, uh, the commission was responsible for convening committees such as the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, the Horse Racing Committee, the Gaming Research Advisory Committees, and um, various subcommittees. Um, it allowed us um, to more efficiently schedule those meetings. Um, as you know, we've struggled sometimes due to quorum. So I will um, leave it at that and ask if there are any questions. Questions for John. So the, the proposal is that um, you have a draft that we've been able to meet with you on um, and uh, we would be authorizing you to finalize it and then we would um, um, be authorizing our signatures to be placed on it. Is that correct? That's that's right. Right now, it's a it's a draft um, without your signatures, and um, we would uh, circulate the letter to you, and um, with your permission, send it out to the. And the commissioners all have that draft. Um, are there any? Uh, first off. Maybe we should find out if we have a sort of a soft consensus about sending such a letter. And then the second part would be, are there any specific edits or changes you'd want to make or additions you'd want to make to the letter or deletions, I suppose, too. I'll start. Commissioner Zunica, thoughts? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement of uh, sending this, this, this letter, in however form we end up doing it. Um, in support of um, the, um, the, the the potential changes to maintain some of the um, uh, 
the ability to conduct these meetings, um, you know, using the collaboration and the, 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 this technology. So I, um, I'm in general support of it, and um, it'll be all up to the legislature, of course, to um, to address it or the governor to do it in a short-term basis until the legislature does. And Todd, did you mention that the governor, I think the governor uh, might have filed yesterday to extend it out, right? Um, so, yeah. but that would require the, the legislature to act, but it would give the legislature more time to perhaps think more fulsomely about the overall amendments to the open meeting law. Okay. Sorry if I missed that. No, I, I mean, I, I think uh, the point that uh, both Todd and Jill make um, perhaps bears repeating a little bit, um, and that is that um, in our case, there was increased participation. I know there's accessibility issues that, that, that always have to be considered, um, but people who used to have to drive um, to downtown Boston for our meetings, um, even though we streamed them, um there you know there there there's more increase there's there's more participation there's uh, the ability to see who's there which is also an additional feature um so i i um i hope that in the short uh, post pandemic uh, world there's some of these uh, features uh, remain but of course that's all up to the legislature commissioner cameron i see you nodding your head Yes, I, it, it, that certainly is a habit of mine to nod my head when I'm in agreement or I'm saying I hear you. But I do agree. I, I, this is um, thoughtful discussion about this, sending this letter. I'm in agreement that we should send it um, for all the reasons um, already articulated. I'll give one example for me in particular, uh, uh, working as a member of the uh, horse racing committee, um, which required Many changes this year uh, required us to meet a number of times, which would have been very difficult with a member who lives in Western Mass and another member who lives on Cape Cod to meet as quickly as we did to be nimble and um, get the work done in a timely fashion, I think was much appreciated by the um, uh, racing community. And that's just one out of many, many examples I know of how much it did help us complete our work in a timely fashion. So I'm certainly in support that we send this letter. Great example. Commissioner O'Brien. I agree. Um, my experience in this office, but in another office that I was in, in terms of trying to get a quorum um, of physically present, particularly where you, um, we have jurisdiction that spans the Commonwealth and licensees in different parts of the Commonwealth. It definitely makes executing the meetings, reaching the quorum easier, but then also their ability to access and participate because they don't have to drive in, et cetera. I think it's one of the most um, useful parts of this, as, as well as the ability to do things quickly. Which, again, we did, as soon as this was available to us, we literally did it the next day. So I think that it's definitely a value add if we send it to the legislature, giving them our perspective. No, I think that's a really good observation, Commissioner O'Brien, that literally this, this topic has just come up and we're able to, to meet and, and have uh, an informed team presentation um, today uh, because we knew we could act on it. Uh, as, as this past year uh, has taken place, you know, you've all heard me say the word that Commissioner Cameron um, said and Jill alluded to it, I know it's in the letter, is our nimbleness has so improved because it, it allows us to do our business in, in a timely fashion. Um, and that, that has to help the interests of the Commonwealth overall. Our licensees are able to, to hear from us um, in a faster fashion. And so um, just today, we were able to convene both our agenda setting meeting at 9 a.m and then have this full meeting at 10, really it would have been almost unfair at times to ask of that with all of um, us having commutes and, and childcare issues and, and other issues to have to deal with. 
and that's just the four of us. Never mind, as we mentioned, all of the licensees and the the, um, the participants. So I I really um, I know that we're not singular here. I think all of the other public bodies across the Commonwealth, particularly municipalities, are asking for the continued relief, and it's been such a great experiment. Um, you know, out of out of some really difficult times, this has been one of the things that we really have recognized as being helpful to, to the interests of, of the public. Um, I would, the only other example that I would offer is, if you recall, we did, I can't remember now, maybe it was September of 2020, where we were re, um, considering the renewal of um, Cambridge Park Casino's license, and we held a public hearing. And I think we were able to observe that the quality of the public input wasn't compromised whatsoever. In fact, probably enhanced because people could easily um, come during the workday. You know, they are able to join in a way that they might not otherwise have been able to join if they had to leave their offices or commute into to publicly appear. So um, again, it's just the the overall ease um, and enhancement of participation. So um, with that said, I guess we. We have a consensus on submission. Any particular edits, additions, deletions? Okay, then I think we need a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'm happy to move that the commission issue a letter in support of um, amending the open meeting law to legislation, legislative leadership as discussed today. Second. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Aye. I vote yes. And thank you, 4-0, Vivian. I know this has been a really long meeting and everybody's hanging in there by a thread. Um, we haven't even had a break, really. Um, so I appreciate um, everyone hanging in there. We have one more item on the agenda, and I'm turning now to Dr. Lightbound and Director Griffin again, please. So um, I'll uh, introduce it and turn it over to Dr. Lightbound. Um, we're, this is um, a letter, um, again, to legislative leadership and um, the joint chairs of um, uh, the Committee on Consumer Protection and Licensing. Um, and we are, um, the commission is writing in support of HB 337, um, a bill filed by Rep Representative Techie Chan, an act extending simulcasting and live horse racing um, authorization. So I'm going to actually ask Alex to give you a little bit of background. Thank you, Director Griffin. So um, the Latest authorization extended the um, authorization until July 31st of this year. So we are coming um, up on that expiration soon. So this is just a reminder um, and about the jobs that are um, affected, not just at the racetrack, but um, including um, some of the money that goes into the uh, racing division funding. Um, and all, obviously at this point we are racing live, so um, besides affecting simulcasting and account wagering, it would be affecting the horsemen as well. And, um, you know, they plan their races ahead of time. And so um, if it got, um, you know, if there's a disruption in the racing, that disrupts their whole schedule. So just a reminder um, to the legislature that it is expiring and, um, you know, that if we can avoid Having it expire, that would be wonderful for the industry. Any questions? Uh, this letter looks familiar. We've uh, filed similar uh, letters in the past as a reminder of this deadline. Um, Commissioner Cameron, do you, you're so familiar with it. You wanna comment, any questions? I, I, I think it's a really uh, important letter to send we just want to make sure that it, it gets done in a timely fashion and a, and a little reminder does not hurt at all because um, it is problematic if the season is disrupted. So I'm in full agreement. Excellent. Commissioner Zinnigar. 
Yes, yeah, same here, uh, in full agreement of support of the extension uh, because of the impending deadline. And something I brought up and um, to, to Jill and, and Todd and they're uh, prepared to at a later time, perhaps um, communicate this in some other fashion, mm. is addressing the, um, the uncertainty that one year extensions create. On the, especially on the thoroughbred industry. Um, this letter is critical for, um, for the standard bread uh, live racing operations and, and, and by extension the simulcast facilities. But um, when it comes to the thoroughbred uh, uh, racing industry, there's, as we all know, money that came from the Race Horse Development Fund that's intended to supplement purses as long as there are five races. And uh, it's, it's uh, perhaps well understood that one year extensions do not necessarily create the certainty that might be needed to make the best use of those uh, available monies. So, um, so long as we can address that at a later time, um, you know, in, a, in whatever other context, uh, frankly, we've also written, written it in the past in the annual report, but um, it's incumbent upon us to remind uh, those who are um, the legislature who, um, who are more familiar with these uh, matters that that's also a pending uh, matter. Okay, Commissioner Brian. Uh, I agree uh, with what um, Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Zuniga said, both in terms of just getting this letter out um, in timely fashion on the extension and then once again offering up you know, our availability in terms of looking at a longer term solution for the industry. So I think the letter's good. I, I absolutely support sending it out. And I do believe that that, that uh, a follow up letter or communications or meetings contemplated on, on uh, the, the wider topic. So, um, but for now, we'll follow past practice and, and unless there's any edit, I'm not seeing any suggested edit, then we'll just, um, provide authorization for the signatures um, through a motion. If I could have that, please. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, uh, I move that the Commission issue a letter in support of extending the racing related laws to legislative leadership as discussed today. Second. Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you, Vivian. Quite a meeting. Um, I think that we covered a lot um, in a, you know, by pivoting quickly to accommodate the governor's order um, and advisories, CDC guidance, all a little bit more rapidly than we expected. Anything that we need to discuss further on that front, commissioners, that we haven't addressed in a formal fashion on the agenda. Okay. Um, so um, with that, the, the weekend is coming. May 29th um, opens up the Commonwealth and I know you join me in, in wishing our entire Commonwealth um, the benefits and the, sort of the fun of, a, of an expansion, but also that we all stay, stay safe. Um, just keep on knocking on wood. You know, the, the trends, the vaccination rates are all really positive. It's just what we hoped for and what science is allowing. And you know, thanks to those folks who figured out this vaccination, right? It's, it's kind of And the people making it happen as well. It's yeah. not, it's, that's yeah. also needed. Absolutely. The implementation, uh, no easy task. Anything else, Commissioner Cameron, you want to add before we get a motion to adjourn? Uh, nothing to add. Well said. We're ready to go. Ready to go. Commissioner O'Brien, you're ready to go. Ready to go. Want to move? Uh, move to adjourn. Second that. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate all the uh, hard work today. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, 4-0. Thank you, team. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.